Uh, good morning, one and all, and welcome to this meeting of the Education and Learning Committee. Before we get into the business, I'd just like to welcome my new Vice Chairman, Councillor Maureen Johnson. Uh, she's hit the ground running, taking part in the head teacher interviews already, so uh, I think she's really looking forward to the, to the role. Uh, George Jimison, however, has, will be a hard act to follow. He's shown passion and commitment to education, and I'm sure he'll continue to do that. Uh, in in the, the forthcoming meetings of this this committee, this meeting is being live streamed and recorded, and will be available for viewing through our council's website. Remote participants, please follow the good practice guidance, including muting microphones, switching off your video when you are not addressing the meeting, writing speak in the Teams chat function when you want to contribute. If you're in the hall, you can do this on your iPhone or iPad. Please don't repeat contributions already made by other members. No material should be posted in the chat function if it is intended as part of the discussion. Usual standing orders apply, including any votes will be undertaken by a roll call. If any member has to leave the meeting, please either leave the Teams meeting for that period of time or write leave in the Teams chat function, then join when you rejoin the meeting so we can keep track on whether the meeting is correct. All members should speak clearly, taking their time and speaking directly into the microphone when making contributions. When referring to reports, please provide reference to the relevant page paragraph to allow everyone to follow. Please focus contributions on areas where clarification is required or to propose an alternative to a recommendation. We have several report reports to consider today and anticipate we'll deal with the business in an efficient manner. So, Nick, could you give us a set of apologies? Uh, thanks, Chair. Morning, members. Um, in the hall today, we have 13 members present. We have 10 members um, joining the meeting via Teams, and we have three apologies um, from Councillor Dennerley, uh, Mel McGill, and um, Sam Scobie. Okay, thank you. I also give. Uh, I also give. Uh, 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 that I give agreement to participating remotely. Declarations of interest. Do members have any declarations of interest? Not seeing any, so we'll move on to Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I've got a declaration of interest in the Lowburn Primary. Um, I sit on the Parent Council. Thank you. So that's a, sorry, that's agenda item. There's two, I see two has come along. Um, agenda item eight and... Could you speak up a wee bit, Paula? Oh, sorry, sorry. So, yeah, agenda item eight, eight and agenda item five, but that's just to note, so... Good, thank, thank you. A minute of the previous meeting is 26th of January. These are for approval. Happy with those? Thank you. We're on to item four, rural school provision, Carsby and Primary School and Nursery Report by Director of Skills, Education and Learning. Uh, the report sets out the extensive consultation results and the proposed closure of Carsby and Primary School. Uh, Louise Ray is here in the first instance to assist members on any questions. And I will open, the, open this up to debate. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to ask something about process, really. Um, I presume what we have to do is make the case for closure rather than keeping the school open or mothballed. So what are the regulations or statutory requirements for school closure? Is it just the number of pupils and what other factors have to be taken in place, for example, location, ease of transport, etc.? Louise? I guess there's a, there's a lot of elements to that, isn't there? There's um, pupil role, the numbers that, that are existing within the community and the interest of the catchment children to attend the school is obviously a significant factor. Um, there is proximity to other provision in the area. I would add at that point that there is no national 
um, guidance um, at this point on how far children of various ages should or should not travel to attend nursery, primary or secondary school. Um, we could go look beyond that and the amenities with, that the school provides and the other schools that are nearby and what they um, can also um, offer. Um, everything is obviously detailed in the Act and that is what we're duty bound to follow. Would you follow up, Councillor Law? No, that's fine, thanks. I've got, I've got Councillor Stevenson and Councillor Dorward. Right, thanks, Chair. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, Part of the reason that we'll, we'll continue with the moth, well, we're being asked to agree to continue with the mothballing is to do with the housing plan. Do we know what the housing plan is? And um, is there any dates for completion on this? So we know within two years what will happen. And do we have any figures for how much it costs to actually mothball the school? Thank you. So my understanding is that the community have commissioned the South of Scotland Community Housing to audit um, the housing requirement, the demand in the area. So that survey um, was conducted in January. There is yet to be that report published, so I can't um, comment any further on that, I'm afraid. And I guess that will dictate the community's timelines for how they proceed. Um, what I can add is that there is no identified um, land within Kisfern at this point in time for development on our local development plan. Um, your second question was, I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> How much does it cost to multiple the school? Oh, yeah. No problem. Um, that was all detailed in the financial report. It's about £1,400 a year. You want to come back, Paula? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Maybe one for you. Are we taking all this into account when we are developing the school's estate strategy? Thank you. What, somebody want to comment on the school estate strategy, Lauren? Th thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, absolutely, all of these things have to factor into it. We, we need to look holistically across the whole estate. Um, we, we're, we're, we've started the engagement process. We have a, an, an event tonight down at Dobiti. Um, so once we've gathered all of those information, that's, that's the criteria that will be used to define what our school estate looks like. And, and elements like this absolutely feed into that process to make sure that we get the best possible outcome that we can. Thank you. Um, Right, I've got Councillor Dorward, followed by Councillor Jimson, Campbell and Scobie. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair, and congratulations, Vice Chair, on your appointment. Um, a question on, basically, the timescales for this. So we've had a, a consultation, the, 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 the school's been mothballed since 2019, yeah? And then because of COVID, it appears there's been some glitches with the consultation period, so it was relaunched. And a proposal is to mothball for a further two years, which would be mothballed for four years <clears throat> with little material change in circumstances. As far as that, you're nodding your heads, so is that a yes? Little material change in circumstances in Karsfern. Um What I would then ask, given the fact that a little material change in circumstances, and there doesn't appear to be any future change in circumstances as yet, I totally understand why the community would want some time to look at housing and raise that case to, to, to increase the population. But there doesn't seem to be any progress on that at the moment. And actually, if you look at the um, consultation document, there's actually doesn't seem to be a great deal of progress is going to happen in future. I'm not asking you to agree or disagree with that one. I'm just, this is my interpretation of the document. Um, so the issue for me would be, why are we allowing a further two years as opposed to, could we shorten the period um, for consultation and kick it off in a year's time as opposed to two years' time, unless there's any vast material change in circumstances. Would that be something that could be considered as a possibility? Thanks. Louise? So the statutory guidance is quite clear. We can't produce um, a revised proposal paper for five years. We can recommence some form of informal consultation, pre-consultation, whatever you want to call it within that timescale, but we cannot present a revised proposal paper and, paper and um, basically start the uh, closure process again for five years. That's obviously to protect, protect the school community. The, the Act is very much wrote in a way when you are um, closing a school that's actively got children in attendance, which you can understand why you'd want to not disturb those children further. What, what to come back, Linda? 
It's, it's probably my naivety. I know that I mean, the car, car steering is closed, so it's mothballed. There's no children in attendance. There's nothing happening there. The buildings are costing 1,400p per annum to maintain, so I would imagine maintenance isn't top of the, you know, top of the agenda either. So we're closing something for a further... Mothballing, sorry, not closing. Apologies, everybody. Mothballing something for two years to... I'm not quite getting to what end, apart from following stat statutory pro process. Is that one of the reasons that we have to do this, yeah? Yes, we've taken on board what the community has told us as part of the consultation um, and that they're obviously keen for that um, opportunity to um, grow the community and, and that's what we've taken on board. Final point? Thanks, Linda. Chair. Appreciate that. Um, the other thing I was going to, to add in, again, if you look at the um, report that's Appendix 1 that I've got, um, if you has some very good interviews with the pupil population who are currently at Dalry, and they're very much for staying at Dalry as well. So again, it's about how much agency do they get in this process, because I know that we're talking about a statutory process, we're talking about HMIE, and we're talking about lots of different stakeholders, but arguably the main stakeholders for me would be the people who are attending the school. Um, who are the pupils, and the vast majority that I can see from this, this report are saying they want to stay where they are. Thank you. It's a comment more than a, but if you want to come back, it's great. Thanks, Chair. Louise. If you don't mind. Um, I think what's quite difficult in this instance is there are very um, low numbers, numbers living within the catchment, so to be able to kind of um, hear their voice, it, it's taken as a whole with other children from Dalry because we can't pull out individual children because they would then be identifiable. What we will do is, is if it's the decision is taken to um, not close the school and continue, continue with mothballing, we will go to the community imminently and um, assess their desire for the, for the children, sorry I shouldn't say the community, the, the families of the children who are eligible to attend the school from August and establish how many children um, could potentially go back and that will um, then I guess make it'll start the process in terms of whether it's continuation of mothballing or um, the school is reopened. Thanks Louise. Uh, Councillor George Jimson. Thanks Chair and congratulations to Maureen. Um, my question is just to build on build on Larn's response to the learning estate forward planning. Shutting small schools is, is really complex, it's, it's really emotional. The bottom line for the Education and Learning Committee, I would suggest, is education and learning. And it's for the benefit of, of the children in that community to their expectations of education and learning. And I'm not dodging the issue that, that local communities care about the local school. I, I, I'm exactly the same. I live near Dornock, and the school was closed in the 50s. Uh, <laughs> So my plea is that when we're in these very complex emotional discussions, that we keep our eye on the, the strategic importance of education and skills for all children in Dumfries and Galloway, and we look for the best outcomes for those children. Um, and I think that's what the officials are trying to do, and we need to accelerate that. The transformation work has been, has been done several years ago. The demographics are very clear, and yet, there will, maybe, there will still be a place for smaller rural schools, but let's look at it strategically and not piecemeal, one by one, and have a bun fight and fall out about it. We need, for me, we, we need to look at, at this from an emotional and a strategic pers perspective. And too often in the past, we've been standing up for the wee guy against the big guy, and it's not about that, it's about, it's about the children. So we need to get the best policies out there that we can all agree with. So um, I just want to commend the team for working as hard as they are and going through the processes, which are really complicated and they're really emotional. And I also commend local people for standing up for what they think is the right thing to do. But we, we need to try and be measured and reasonable about the whole thing. Sorry, that was a bit long-winded. OK, thanks. I didn't detect the question there, but just a, a passionate speech there. And uh, uh, we'll note your thanks for the, for the work of our, of our officers. Thank you. Uh, we've got Councillor Dougie Campbell. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
I, I, I agree with some of the, the comments that George w was making there, but I come in here as uh, a ward councillor for the, where Carsfern is, is, is situated and also as a, a new member of the, this committee. So I hope you'll forgive me if it, I've got several questions here to ask, um, just to clarify some points for me. Um, and, you know, I feel passionately that we should do everything we can to help sustain remote rural communities, but also we need to give careful consideration to the, the education of our, our, our young people. Um, so I, I don't have any firm view um, on what the outcome should be, but I think it'd be helpful because um, to, for me to ask these questions because I know that uh, Carsfair and Community Council in particular are passionate about uh, keeping the, the, the school open, um, and I've got to recognise that. Um, <clears throat> so the, the questions I have are, how many children of P1 to 7 age are in the Carsfair catchment area at, at the present time? What, what would need to change to reopen the school during mothballing? I'm, I'm, I'm not clear about that. So what would have to, what would that material change be? Um, and will, will this committee receive updates during the mothballing period so that we know what the, the, the situation is? And, you know, we also were speaking earlier about the potential for housing development, which the, the chair of the community council is emailed us all to, to remind us of. <clears throat> and m my final question is that in the report, it says the mothballing period will be up to two years. Can you just clarify for me what, what that actually means? Um, is there flexibility for this committee, as uh, Councillor Dorwood was suggesting, a mothballing period of, of one year? Um, because I think it's important that the community uh, understand that position and what it actually means up to two years of if the officers could clarify that for me, please, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Okay, Louise, in the first instance. Um, if we focus on the numbers, I think, for next academic year, given um, the amount of time we've, we're already through this academic year. So in terms of primary one to primary seven, so living within the catchment for next year, there is currently 11 with a possible 12th child. Um, I say that tentatively because they've not um, moved in and anything can happen. Um, with regard to what needs to change, we brought, um, I think it's probably pertinent to raise um, the paper around mothballing that was brought to committee in December of last year, which um, gave a threshold of 10 um, for a school to, uh, with a, sc a school with a role of 10 or less um, would um, be considered uh, for mothballing and that would give the officers an opportunity to engage with those schools at that point in time. Um, in terms of updates for committee, um, at this point I'm, I don't think there's anything agreed. However, as mentioned before, we are going to do um, a yearly audit and we're currently doing that with other schools that are mothballed to establish um, the desire to, to, to attend those schools and, and I guess it's possibly pertinent to bring that, that information back to committee, um, not just for Kispen, but also for the other schools that are, that are mothballed and are in a, a similar situation. Um, as for the mothballing period, I guess we are dictated by what the Act says. And the Act says that we can't go back for five years to, to attempt closure. So in theory, the school could be uh, mothballed for a further five years plus the consultation period after that. Um, I hope that answers your questions. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Maybe just uh, clarify uh, a point there, please. So you, you said that there are 11, possibly 12 uh, primary age children in the Carsfern catchment area, but the, the, the paper in December uh, it, it, the position was if there was 10 or less pupils, a school would be considered for closure and mothballing. So uh, obviously, you know, if there's 11 or 12, it's above that, 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 that figure of, of 10. So could you maybe clarify why uh, that isn't an important number in this? I think what the difference here is there are 11, possibly 12 children living within the catchment. They, 
aren't necessarily or wouldn't necessarily all choose to attend Casvan. They have either never been at the school, they're established in other schools, or there's simply not parental choice for those children to attend there. And I can't comment on what it would be for next year, but what we do know right here, right now, and it's in the committee report at um, point three point seven, is we surveyed all the families as part of the consultation process. And for this year, there was 10 children living in the catchment area. Those that um, expect, expressed a desire, we, we targeted all families um, to establish this. For those that were interested in returning, and also those that did not um, respond, we included them in the numbers for the avoidance of doubt. There were only six children at that point that would, um, their families would want them to return. Uh, as Louis says, there's 12, up to 12 children in the catchment area, but experience shows that at, uh, the, the, these parents may not choose to, to send their children there. Um, and I think the reason why the, the mothballing process started was because the, there was only two member, two, two children actually turned up for the, for the school session. That's the reason why we mothballed it, even though there were other children in the catchment area that, that could have gone to the school. You want one further question, Dougie? Um, no, no the, the, the responses have been... Uh, very helpful. It's, it's, it's a difficult situation, this, because as I, I said in my, my sort of opening remarks, uh, a community recognises that a school is, is very important for uh, the sort of future. Um, and if there's a school, it may bring in young families. If there's not, it, it might not. But we've also got to consider the educational experience for the, the, the children and take into account the, the parents' views. So it's a very difficult enough. I fully appreciate that. Um, but I think uh, it, was, it was helpful to hear that the engagement process will begin immediately after the committee uh, today, depending on what decision we make on the recommendations. So uh, from that point of view, I'm happy with the, the, the information that I've received so far. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Willie Scobie, and then we'll go to the rec recommendations. It's really just seeking clarification. There's been so many figures banded about, you know, and, and I'm looking at 3.7 that talks about 15 children, uh, and you referred to Chair as two children. And I think I, I go back many years ago, and, and, and the one that springs to mind was Lockin School, uh, where the, it was the parents that decided uh, and voted by their feet to close the, the, the Lockin School, but there was still a, a, a fair number of children. Not the same, the number from the catchment area, because they, they chose uh, where they wanted they, their, their child to be taught, but they reached a figure where it was the parents uh, that decided they wanted it closed. The other one that comes to mind was Glen Trill, uh, where I think it was about down to eight, and maybe even five. Uh, and we closed that one uh, and then had to uh, go back uh, because the Scottish Government said we had not carried out the, the proper consultation. So it's really, uh, what is the figure in terms of the catchment area? Uh, is it 15 or, uh, or again it talks here in 22, 23 is 10 uh, uh, and so forth. So what is the actual figure? Uh, uh, and the other thing is that in 3.9, it talks if we were, uh, were it to, to be reopened. So in all this period, and I heard Linda talking about it, you know, mothballed, and now we're told that that's five years before you can return to even consider, and I'm not saying that we should uh, close it, because like others have said, uh, it, it's important that, that we maintain rural schools as much as we possibly can. Uh, but it's this whole idea. What does it actually mean by reopen? Because if it's mothballed, then there is at least uh, an assemblage or a building there. Uh, but, you know, uh, as we did in Glen Trill, where it's then uh, given over to the community and the, for community use. What, what is the position in terms of this uh, concept of reopen? So to clarify the numbers, um, when the school closed, there were only two children in attendance. They were both in primary seven, so they completed their primary seven year, and then it was closed. As you spoke about with other locations, um, there were other children living within the catchment that they had already actively made the decision to attend elsewhere. 
The 15 um, at 3.7 refers to all of the children that were surveyed as part of the consultation. They were from birth to primary seven. So that's where there's a slightly um, different figure there, but that also helped us to project into the future those children coming through in that community. With regard to your second um, question, so if I'm right in interpreting this, the, if the school continues to be mothballed, um, it will stay in its kind of current state unless there is sufficient demand for it to reopen. If it was to be closed, that's the point at which the community um, asset transfer process could get involved. So I think that's maybe what you're asking me. Um, so that's the point at which um, other uses of that building could be looked at. We can't really look into that whilst the building's mothballed because we could have to reopen it if the demand was there. I hope that answers your question. So it goes back to the question that Dougie asked then. So, so is it a constant review for the whole period that it's mothballed? And, and, and when does it trigger that it comes back to the committee for the committee to determine whether it uh, is reopened or that triggers again a, a, a consultation period of closure? What, what, what is this period? Is it, is it mothballed that we set two years or five years? What is the figure that we set before it triggers again that it comes back with a report to committee? We would need to, we cannot commence uh, or publish another proposal for closure until after five years. So we have five years and that five years is either the school is mothballed or it may be reopened in that time if there is, if there is sufficient demand. The reference to two years is for us to then recommence pre-consultation, but it would not, um, that's that's not the school reopening or um, a change to the status of the school, that's with regard to um, us producing another closure paper. Uh, just, yeah, and so just clarify, so it's constantly under review for the two years that it's mothballed, and it could trigger at any time if there was a demand and the number stacked up. So um, a good example is that we are currently reviewing another catchment um, mothballed school right now. What, we, what we're saying is we will do an annual review. So we take the primary one enrolments, which happen in January. We have to let that process happen. And then after March 15th, because that's kind of the legal um, date at which we are obliged to take on any um, placing requests, um, that we would then um, do an annual review of everyone living in the catchment area to assess the demand. So we're constantly reviewing this. So when would we hear back about about any any changes? When would we get a report back on that? And um, depending on the outcome of today's committee, um, we will go. If the decision is to um, not close the school and to continue on with mothballing, we will be. Um, re um, we will be surveying all families within the catchment area imminently, um, and then it's not until after we have had, got that data that we'll be able to feed that information back, pro likely along with other schools that are also mothballed. And will we get a report back on all the data from this consultation? Yes, we will bring that back to a further committee. Okay, we'll get we'll get the once we've got all that information, we'll bring it back to the committee and update where we are on these things. Okay, so we'll go to the recommendations. Uh, we're going to note the contents of the statutory consultation report and the proposed closure of Carsfane Primary School and Nursery as detailed at the appendix as stated, and to agree to implement the recommendation to, to stop the closure process in favour of a further mothballing period of up to two years at which stage the pre-consultation would start afresh and seek to capture any changes to the current position. Are we happy with that? Agreed. We're on to the statutory consultation in Lorburn Primary School, report by Director of Schools, Education and Learning. Uh, Lauren Foss is here to assist members in any questions. Uh, I would ask members to uh, to delay any questions on Dumfries Learning Town next step until that item comes up late in the gen, because this is just a, this is just on the Lorburn Primary School consultation. So, open to members for that. David, David Sturt. Thanks, Chair. I noticed at the page bottom of page seventeen, three point three about the consultation, and also notice at three point six one, 
Education Scotland says the council propo proposal builds a strong case to relocate. Are we at a planning stage yet for this to begin? Or are we, are we, are we dragging on and dragging on? Because it seems to be on the agenda for a while. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, in terms of the statutory consultation process, that has concluded, and in terms of members taking the decision today, if the paper is agreed, then that gives us permission at any point to move Lobham Primary School into Minerva. I guess the question really, though, is around when will Minerva be ready for Lobham to move into, and that's probably better covered under the DLT2 paper, if, if that's OK. That's fine. Chair Lam. Any further contributions to this item? Let's go on to the recommendations. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to ask a question. I notice in 3.6.1, there were some concerns raised around the planned shared use of the Minerva building. And I just wonder what impact having the primary pupils in that building will have on the secondary, because will it impact on the secondary school role? And obviously, if the building is changing use, um, will that impact on the role for academy pupils and then impact on the other secondaries within the town? Thank you. Um, I, I think um, we're talking about the overall capacity rather than role, rather than the pupils themselves, the number of pupils. Um, so just now, Dumfries Academy has capacity for around 1,270 pupils. There's about 600, just below 600 pupils today. Um, so, so the building's around twice the size it needs to be. Even with the removal of Minerva from the footprint, there's still capacity for around 900 children. Um, now, as the development and the design work continues further forward, we are designing around um, a, a capacity that marries up to the pupil role and the projected pupil role for the academy pupils and for Lobham Primary School pupils as well. Um, now, whilst that design isn't finalised and concluded because it's tied into the, the, the funding and everything else that will come onto in the DLT2 paper, um, I'm, I'm confident that we have enough space for all of the children in the academy and we have enough space for all the children in um, Lobham Primary School. I would, I would also add that this model is not unique um, because it's effectively an all through or a shared campus and we have a number of those across the authority where we have a, a primary and a secondary um, in, inside the same facility. Um, there are a number of, as it, as it stands just now, a, a small number of shared spaces that we're looking to propose within it. So that has the added benefit for both primary and secondary. So things like the library or the ICT suites, etc. But they're designed in such a way that they can be completely primary use or completely secondary use. Or should the management team decide to have a little bit more of an overlap, um, then they've got that flexibility as well. So hopefully that answers the question. Okay, okay Julie. Uh, yes, thank you. I've got, I've got. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Chair. I'm just wondering what the view of the teachers at Lorburn Primary School is and if, if they support this move. Thank you. Um, my understanding is they would move today if they were allowed. So, very supportive. Uh, I've got Councillor Law. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, from the sounds of it, the space in the Minerva building is more than enough to accommodate both primary pupils and a share with a secondary. I just want to just back up the response there about shared use because, okay, it's a purpose-built school at Dalbeatty, but it works incredibly well where there are areas that are strictly primary, areas that are strictly secretary, but the secondary, but it does actually work really well. And I gather from the report it says that the secondary wouldn't necessarily have access to the primary, but it might go the other way. And I just think it's a, a model to go for because then it's a great integration of the children as well. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I think, you know, in terms of um, opportunities for youngsters, it's, it's steps forward and having those shared spaces. If you think of all the specialist areas within a secondary school, drama, art, music, technical, um, that primary schools can now walk down the corridor and get access to through a, a supervised route, 
are absolutely fantastic. But there's lots of other opportunities inside shared locations, shared campuses, where there are things like um, dining spaces, um, you know, lunchtime for secondaries, different times from primaries. So let's combine the use of these areas and put the investment um, that we, we get back into the pot from not having two dining spaces into the rest of the project. So there's lots of real opportunities through that. The, the inclusion part, the mentoring, the, you know, all of these other softer sides rather than the physical building and the opportunities they bring are something that I, I think is uh, something we should absolutely grab through these opportunities. So thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Young. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it would have been good to have an um, outline sketch of what the proposed new Lowerburn Primary School looked like as part of these papers. I know they're available elsewhere, um, but that's just a wee mode from my side. In terms of school security, I'm aware that Dumfries Academy pupils sort of vacate quite considerably the school grounds at lunchtime and go to the shops, etc. Will the new prime, the relocated Lordburn Primary School, be totally secure and the pupils unable to leave the buildings and grounds? Thank you, Chair. Lauren. Thank, thank you, Councillor Young. I, I, absolutely. Um, the, the, the safety and well-being of the staff and the pupils is paramount in any new design as we move forward. And, and we have a, a requirement to comply with um, particular building standards. Um, and, and access, egress from a building is something that's factored into that. Um, we, we are, I, I guess, um, a little bit restricted in terms of it's a listed building, but that doesn't stop us from making sure that door entry systems, etc., are put in place so that there's no unauthor unauthorised access or no uncontrolled egress from the building. In terms of the grounds, um, that's a little bit more complicated because you have to be able to come through the grounds to get to the front door. So, for example, a delivery or a parent visiting, um, that's all factored into the design moving forward. Um, we, we do have a, a design or a company working with us on what what the um, proposal looks like just now, and it's something that we work really closely with the staff of both Lobbin Primary School and Dumfries Academy to make sure that whatever we're, we're proposing um, is something that, that fits in with their expectations and how they operate the school um, and how, how they see improvements being made over their existing facilities that they've got just now. Um, designs and the footprint and all of these other bits and pieces of detail will become available, but for in, in terms of the purpose of this report, this is just really looking for permission to, to relocate at the school rather than the, the, the detail of the design work itself, which will really come through the DLT2 part um, later on. Thank you. Councillor Young, are you happy with that? Yes, I'm quite reassured by that, Chair. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Stevenson, you want to come in? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, you know, I would ask this question on any school that's about to move or get built, but is there a possibility maybe in the future that the committee could actually visit the school and maybe look at the plans and the layouts and how it would actually be implemented? Um, do you know, I've obviously got a vested interest in both, so I've been to both of them, but I think it would be good uh, and a really good positive thing if the committee could actually maybe do a site visit and see how the layout would actually be for the Lowerburn Primary and the academy side of the building. Thank you. Yeah, I th yeah. Uh, absolutely, that's something we can facilitate. Um, d difficult to go around something that hasn't yet been changed, but we, what we do, um, it's getting all fancy now, we can do virtual reality tours of what the proposals look like. It's not at that stage. We do have a floor plan, we do have that marked out, so happy to share that um, at the appropriate time with members so they can see what's taking place in there. Um, and when we've got the, th the 3D um, walkthroughs and visuals, that's a, a link that we can share, that we can, we can go through. Um, but as I say, we... we we have shared and discussed the floor plans with the, the staffing cohorts and through some of the parent council groups as well. And, but if that's something members were interested in, then we could, we could certainly facilitate that. Paula. Thank you, Chair. My understanding is uh, that there won't be much changed, well, too much changed due to the, um, the grading of Dumfries Academy. Uh, the building itself so it would still be good to go and see even just the layouts and the, and the impact it will have um, between the two schools thank you thank you uh, well, no more people wishing to speak uh, so we'll go to the, the recommendations member asked to note the content of the consultation paper to relocate Lorburn primary schools from its existing building to the Minerva building on the Dreyfusen Academy campus as detailed Appendix 
to note that HM Spector, inspectors agreed that the council provides a strong case to relocate Lorburn Primary School from its existing building into the Minerva building on the Dreyfus Academy campus, as highlighted in section 3.6.1 of the report and in the appendix. Everybody happy with that? Agreed. And we're now going on to another statutory consultation of Wallace Hall Academy report by Director of Skills, uh, Education and Learning. Kevin Williamson is here to assist members on any questions and I'll open up the meeting to member debate. We'll go to the recommendations on that one. Yeah, I have no issues on this in particular, but w one query I have, one slight concern is that I've sat in quite a lot of uh, appeals, placement appeals. This is obviously quite a reasonable and sensible approach, but, but does it set a precedent for other boundary claims where, where we often see the case where parents are quite keen to get their children into a school out with their catchment area? This is obviously a sensible approach to take in this particular case, but it does set a precedent that other parents and schools might want to use as a precedent to sidestep basically the, the, the procedures for going to your own catchment school in an appeals process. Lauren wants to come. Thank you, Chair. And it's a valid question, and absolutely, you know, what we're doing here is, is changing a catchment area at the request of a community to support families with transport arrangements. Um, now, we, we know that our school estate is changing. We know that our catchment areas are um, dated, and for, some, for, for various different reasons, they follow parish boundary lines, roads, hillsides, etc., etc., and, and through growing and growth through the housing um, market, etc. additional housing is coming up, and sometimes they don't sit within the right catchment area. Sometimes we need to take cognizance of the, the, the um, parental choice and the movement of children. Um, but what, what we do as officers, firstly, is assess all of that before even bringing it in front of members. So uh, it was, oh gosh, it would be before um, the COVID-19 pandemic, we, we assessed this and looked at it and, and decided that it was something appropriate to bring in front of um, yourselves to take a decision on whether we should take this forward as a, a, a true proposal and going through the statutory consultation process. So we would vet the system so that there's no... Um, I guess anomalies coming through where it's small numbers, individuals looking to use the system, if you like, to, to try and, and alter that um, entitlement to, to a, a, a school of their choice. Um, for, for us inside this one, the, the history was fairly clear that the, these group of families were always voting with their feet. It sat out on a little nub within the catchment area, so it was very sensible to change that. Um, so I think we, we're quite confident that we've got a quality assurance check in place to, to stop that sort of thing from happening. So, Just a quick feedback. Yeah, that, 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 that's exactly the answer I was looking for, that we're aware of the situation, because, again, my concern is that some schools, for whatever reason, lose popularity and it's almost a, a crowd effect. And we, we really don't want schools to be disadvantaged in terms of numbers because of perception that another school is better, but you're obviously aware of, of the potential for that. If I may, Chair, just, just, just to add finally that actually this all also goes back into the school estate modelling. Um, we need to look where parental choice is and how that moves within the, the catchment areas into the schools that they're going into. So as well as reviewing the criteria for what defines a school and where it sits, all of this is captured within that whole process. So we get a whole scale review through the whole thing. OK, thanks. I've got a Councillor Dempster online. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, and I very much endorse what uh, Ilaren has had to say in respect to this. As far as parental choice is concerned, it's probably not done some schools any favours, but that's by the by. As far as this goes, all of these schools associate themselves with rural schooling and with Wallace Hall. And I think we do always judge every application or request on its own merit. 
and I'm absolutely content with the proposal that's been put before you today, Chair. Thank you, and thanks, members, for your time. Thanks, Jim. And we'll move on to the recommendations now. Member asked to note the contents of the statutory consultation report and the proposed changes within section 17, page 13 of the appendix, and to agree to implement the recommendation to change the catchment area of Dunscore Primary School, Hollywood Primary School, Wallace Hall Academy, and North West Community Campus. Everybody happy with that? Yep. We're on to seven property building school asset class synthetic, synthetic sports surface provision report by Director of Schools Education and Learning. It's a report requested by members asking for information of sports service provisions across DNG. Land Force is here to assist members on any questions. Open to, now to debate. Jim Dempster wishes to come in. Thanks very much, Chair, and I'm grateful to you and Lara and for bringing this report to members today. I think it highlights a number of issues, and I don't think we can be sure or confident that there's a fair representation or, or a fair distribution of sport pitches across the region. But one of the things that springs readily to mind is that of the 16 senior schools, there is only one school that does not have any access whatsoever to all-weather sports pitch provision, and that's Sankar Academy. And, you know, we, 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 we established this uh, philosophy. We provide the best start in life for all of our children, and that should include children in, in Upper Nithsdale in, in the senior school. And I would hope we'd look at some means of developing sports provision there. If you can just indulge me for a minute, Chairman, the Education Department of Education and Learning signed up, and some members that were here in the previous council will remember it well, there was a, a front page article in Free Scalaby Standard where a wind farm company offered £5 million for the Gretna Gateway project and a million pound plus for Sankar Academy sports pitch if the council would approve their applications for wind farms. The education department signed up to that philosophy because they met with the wind farm developer. There was a planning application submitted successfully to install a 3G pitch at Sankar Academy. Senior officers, and I don't know whether Laran was involved or no, but you'd certainly be aware of it, met with economy and resources, our economic development team, and the education department embraced the concept of a pitch at Sankar Academy. Now, the council rejected the planning application and or applications, and that uh, arrangement fell at the same time. But nevertheless, the principle has been set. And I hope, Chair, that you and members will accept a, a third-day recommendation to this report, which simply says... Uh, we request that the school property manager consults with colleagues in Leisure and Sport, Sport Scotland and other funding bodies to bring forward the report to a future education learning committee and how we might deliver an all-weather sports provision in Upper Nistale. It does no more than that. It does not commit the council to any funding at this stage, but it does ensure that we explore the opportunity and it's something that has already been in train, signed up to by the Education Learning Department and the Council per se, and I hope it's no left to wither in the vine. And I'm happy to take questions of members of any for me personally, and happy to listen to the debate and hope that I get support from members just to explore the options going forward. Thanks, Chairman. Larn. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Councillor Densmer. Um, I think you know the, the, there's a lot in that, and w w one of the things that, that I found really interesting when reviewing all the data on the, the 3G and the synthetic surfaces we have around the authority is actually the history behind them um, and the funding mechanisms and the arrangements in place. Um, the, the vast majority are, have not been delivered through the 
um, schools asset class. Only, only one 3G has been delivered through that as part of a, a, a new build project at, at Langham um, all through. Others within strategic projects and others through Policy and Resources Committee and Sports Scotland funding. So um, whilst I am happy to, to work with colleagues within leisure and sport and through communities to look at funding opportunities and how, and how this project could be uh, looked at and scrutinised in terms of viability, um, I'm not sure if this committee has the, the, um, the right focus on it from purely just an education perspective. I wonder whether it's stronger coming through the community side and through leisure and sport. But that's something that I can take off, off um, um, behind the scenes and have those discussions and, and ensure that what we do is bring a paper back in front of members, whether it's through education and learning or whether it's through communities. Because quite often, the only way to make um, this level of funding available is to have a service level agreement with an associated um, sports user through a sports hub type arrangement. So whether that's Annan Athletic or Stranraer FC or Queen's or Greyston or whoever it happened to be, in this case, um, Nithdale Wanderers, um, and, and, and that collaboration is what secures funding. So I'm, I'm not sure if the focus is purely on the education side. Absolutely, we have a huge focus, an element of that, because it's about core use through the school day. Um, so, so happy to work with, with colleagues and um, the council around how we bring that forward and we can we'll have a discussion behind the scenes to see whether it's back to, to this committee or whether it's through co communities. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Dennis, there's some hope there. Would you want to come back on that? Chairman, uh, just to say thank you very much. I'm encouraged by that and, and I, I accept that it may not be the, the, the right focus for the Education Department. The, the reason I, I raise it here is because the education department embraced the approach by the wind farm company. The education department land has been identified and has already gained planning permission. And I'm more than happy with Laran's proposal that he speaks to colleagues. And uh, I don't expect this to happen tomorrow. What I'm looking for simply from you, Chairman, and from colleagues is a way forward that ensures that some consideration is given and that we try and redress what is clearly an anomaly. I'm sure no member wants to see a a school or a, a school cluster disadvantaged, and it would be to everyone's benefit, including this to help wanderers and the wider community. So, no, I, I'm absolutely happy with that and I'm content as long as there is some way forward found, a, a, a chairman that explores options. That, that's all I ask. Thank you. I would members be happy if we, if, we had, if we had a meeting with Leisure and Sport, joint meeting with Leisure and Sport, and then Bring a, a report back to the appropriate community, committee, whatever is the best way forward. Are we all ha happy with that? Yeah, I'm happy with that. But I would like maybe to broaden it out because we need to know what the facility are, are in other areas. I know Annan Academy is Annan Athletic, but it's not that convenient for folk at Annan Academy to trip across the, the town to the, the football pitch at, 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 at that gala bank so i would like to broaden it out and that's not to undermine the the situation in this deal but if we're doing that sort of thing we could probably take the time to assess all regions uh, how close the the communities are to, the schools are to 3g pitches things like that well perhaps we could broaden that meeting out to look at that as well so look at that as well because it's not just one area of the the facing gallery but it's the whole of so broaden out the meeting to take that into consideration, George. Yeah, okay. Uh, Councillor Scobie wants to come in. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's really one to seek clarification on page 101, where it refers to Stranara carry one full-size football pitch within the running track. Uh, I, I think I've got the club. That refers to the, the, the 3G and not the grass pitch that, that's out with the running track. And I, I believe that both are actually out with the PPP and that the, the council uh, still retain both those pitches. That would be my first clarification. My next one is uh, reference to 3.2.4, and it's more to do with the muggers. Uh, and it's what's referred to in there is uh, no theme on commonality of approach in terms of the maintenance of these. And it's really to seek how we do get some access to some maintenance on these uh, muggers. 
where there are some that are just unusable, uh, and yet the school, it's the only uh, reliance they have on that particular resource. So it's really when it says there that it should be a uh, capital asset class that this sits within, when in fact that they are totally neglected and that there's no maintenance <coughs> on them, unlike the three Gs, where there's sinking funds and various other systems to maintain them, but in muggers there isn't. It. Is there some clarification on this? Or how do we get these muggers maintained so that they are usable? Arm. Um, th thank you, Councillor Scobie. I, I th so, th so the first question around the detail within the report around existing grass pitches is from the contractual arrangements um, back in 2009-10. So, so they are outdated in terms of the 3G and, and the availability of the grass pitches. So it's exactly as you described. Um, so so there's, no, there's no change in terms of uh, responsibilities. Um, the muggers, uh, I, I, I guess it, it's... it's it's complicated because there's such a level of ownership and responsibility across them. The ones that sit within um, the education asset class portfolio are maintained by, by education through the capital investment. So just recently we've invested um, in replacing the carpet at um, Linkluden, Traquir and Cagenbridge. Um, where there are other facilities that aren't within the education portfolio, that, that wouldn't be for me to, to, to make a response in terms of how we maintain those. They, they, they would sit within a, a different um, area of responsibility for maintenance on them. Um, generally speaking, it's through leisure and sport. Um, they have a number across the authority, and they are all, all detailed on page 109 um, in, in, in terms of the operator column for who has... Um, uh, an area of responsibility for them. So if there's one in particular, then um, we can certainly focus in on that and, and go back to the responsible service. Well, yeah, and the one in particular is Park, Park Primary, uh, where it's unusable almost. In fact, it is unusable. Uh, there's Belmont, I'm referring to the 18 that are, in, are within school grounds, and it's that we do have a programme of maintenance and that we can refer to it, because uh, Larn referred there to, I think, three east of the region, but the, 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 there is a, uh, I'm making particular reference to park, but there are others that are just unusable, uh, park in particular, uh, that uh, we need to get some uh, approach to it and some maintenance on them. So if Lauren can uh, deal with the park in the first instance, that would be great. Um, um, for, for both of those schools, they are under leisure and sports responsibility. So I can I can certainly have a, a conversation with with colleagues um, to see what the arrangements they have and see if we can push anything on. But ultimately, it would be the responsibility for any investment in those facilities. And I'm sure you'll put some pressure on leisure and sport police as well. So that's that's good. Councillor Young. Oh, sorry, Thanks he's withdrawn you. his I comments. Thanks, John. Yes, Councillor Scobie's response. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Stephen. No. Uh, no more. Uh, no. Dougie. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, just on, on the topic of uh, muggers, um, I was approached um, just earlier, uh, sorry, late last week about uh, a youth group wanting to source land to build a, 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 a mugger uh, because they're not allowed access to the muggers that are used by the, the academy, Kirkcubri Academy and Kirkcubri Primary School. Um, is this education policy or is this leisure and sport? Um, you know, I think it would be helpful if, if uh, from a community perspective, if the facilities were open to the, the, the public, um, obviously with certain conditions in place, but if you could maybe clarify that, Larn, in terms of uh, who, who would be able to make that decision. Thanks. Um, with, with, with all facilities after hours, th there are the ability to go through a, a let's process, which is managed um, by uh, a, a different directorate. So I'm interested as to, to, to why those facilities may not be available, and, and I don't know the answer to that, um, but what I'll do is I'll look into um, the logistics, logistics behind it. It may just be that there's not been enough level of um, demand, so the, the, the janitorial time to open and close may have been over and above what the, the income would have been from it. Um, we, we as, a, as a service and as a council, have a, a, a process and a policy that 
um, looks at income generation, it looks at uh, um, all spaces being available after hours. So I can only think there's maybe some specific reason. Um, I know recently the, 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 um, the, the synthetic surface at Kukubri was re renewed, so it might have been that it was, a, um, from a, a safety point of view, it wasn't being used at that point in time. But I'll, I'll look into that for you, Councillor. It uh, looks like the meeting with Leisure and Sports is going to be quite a long one. And uh, do we have, a, do we have a, a formal mechanism? Obviously, Leisure and Sport and Education crosses boundaries. Do we have formal mechanisms for meeting with, with uh, Leisure and Sport? It, it's more ad hoc and, and as and when required. Um, but um, we've got good contacts within the service that I'll, I'll speak to after today's meeting to look at to look at those areas. Um, it was something we worked on in collaboration in terms of this report anyway, in terms of provision across the authority. So it's 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 fairly straightforward to have those discussions. I think it will be the. The, the, the next steps after that will be gathering all the data and looking at the demand and looking at what the sports strategy suggests for Dumfries and Galloway and then engaging with Sports Scotland um, to see if there's any funding opportunities. I think that will be the, the trickier part. The internal part for us as a council should be fairly straightforward. Thank you. So we'll go to these recommendations. Paula does want to come in now. Uh, sorry, Chair, yeah, I do want to come in now. Um, I know I, I've had meetings with quite a few community groups in my area, and um, one of the feedbacks that they've given is that actually it's too expensive for to, to hire muggers, and I think that's something that needs to look at. Are we pricing ourselves out of the market um, as a council, which doesn't seem to be um, financially advisable, um, but I think it's something that maybe we should, should look into, especially as part of the, the wellbeing strategy uh, of the council plan going forward. Thank you. Um, I, I think the tricky thing for that, f f from, from a service delivery point of view for us, is that we, we don't set any of those fees that set as a harmonised price structure across the authority um, through the communities directorate. So whilst we're aware of the values and, 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 and aware of the level of use spaces get, it's not anything that we have direct control over. I think we can go to the recommendation now and note the information in relation to the contract detail for existing pitch provision across the PPP schools and the route for any project variations contained within section 3.1 to 3.14 and to note the detail in relation to synthetic surface provision across the authority and the background information in relation to 3G facilities and detail in 3.2 to 3.26 and appendices 1 and 2 and we've got some action points there to to uh, liaise with Leisure and Sport on the Sankar Academy pitch and and other other related issues across the region, as well as a discussion about the the use of facilities in the schools. So you've got a note of those alarms. So happy with those. We're on to the Free Learning Town Phase 2 update report. Lauren is here again to assist members on any questions. Any members come in? I've got Councillor Jimison. Yeah, I'm on page uh, 111, 112, 113. There, there's quite a number of, of issues here that I would like to raise and, and, and query and, and discuss. We've already discussed the, the, the primary school, which is funded, look, the Lowerbourne move, it's got funding. The high school is being, the high school building's been impacted greatly by cost inflations across the board. Um, the LEAP 3 funding, we're unsure of for Dumfries Academy. The queries that I have is, will Dumfries High School be to the standard that was originally, uh, was originally agreed. Is there compromise within the Freeze High School build? Secondly, if we don't get LEAP funding for the Freeze Academy, what's the next plan? Um, if we do get LEAP funding, a wee bit more clarity on the plan. I'm not being challenging here, but these are challenging issues. And the demographics that we are aware of uh, for the cross, the Dumfries and Galloway and then Dumfries, is there, I know we've agreed on four schools in Dumfries, is that still, is it still the plan going forward, given all these challenges? Thank you, Chair. Um, 
they're all really difficult questions and understandably so and they're all things that we would have to bring back and present options to members to, to take those decisions on um, as it stands just now there has still not been an announcement on leap three funding um, I, I, the the um, information we've been told is now that there's been a, a new first minister announced that the panel will be brought together and they'll be looking to see how that um, Leap 3 funding is allocated across the, the, the projects that have been put within there. How successful we'll be in that is, is, is unknown. Um, what I would add is in terms of um, the Leap 2 project, so the, the high school project, the, the quality of the building and the specification of the standards put within there have not changed. We're holding true to everything that we've, we've, we've identified within, within the building in terms of, of those elements. Where we are seeing price increases due to inflation, due to market volatility, due to um, all these elements, um, is having an impact on, on the affordability cap. We are not at a position where we can sign off a stage one agreement because the numbers that are coming back from the contractor are above the money that we have sitting in the pot just now. Um, and that's referenced towards the end of the paper. However, um, at a national level, the uh, Learning Estate Investment Programme Project Board have agreed that there's a, a, an 11% cost variance across the board, across every project across Scotland through LEAP 1 and 2. So they've presented to, to um, ministers a proposal that every project across Scotland should be uplifted by 11%. Now, it's likely that that will be successful. So in terms of affordability for the high school, um, it, w it, it, it will be long-term affordable but the challenge we have is that as a council we have to find the capital up front to be able to build it in the first place we'll get up to 50 percent of the capital costs back over the 25-year period so should that 11 percent of inflation market volatility etc be accepted we will get that back over 25 years but we still have to be able to afford it now we, we don't yet understand what that additional cost is because um, Effectively, the process works through um, four stages. There's a new project request which goes in and says, we want a school for 800 children, and this is the sort of type of thing that it needs to look like, and um, that's put through a cost metric. It's very generic, and it outturns a number. And it says, yeah, that's the kind of number this needs to be. We're within that affordability cap. The next layer down, and um, when it becomes slightly more detailed, is the stage one process, and that's the process we've been going through. We've been lazing with the school, we've been looking at the accommodation schedule, we've been saying, right, we need six English classrooms, we need two uh, craft and design, we need one at home, we can all, all these bits and pieces. And that then gives us a little bit more intelligence to see actually how much is all of this gonna cost. You also start looking at car parking requirements and landscaping and sports provision and all these areas. So it drills down into a much more accurate number, but it's not the final figure yet. So, so stage one, as it stands just now, is, and it's referenced in the report, is around 6% above the affordability cap. So it's 6% higher than £45 million. Technically, we cannot move forward with this process until we have permission um, to either bring the costs back down to the 45 to allow us to move forward or we, we need to find a way to say we've got the flexibility to move forward and spend potentially that additional value. Now that, that additional value isn't yet determined and that's something that we would bring back to members in, in May. Um, the next layer after stage one is the stage two part. So you've got the accommodation schedule, you've got the floor plan, you start looking at all of the technical detail like What's the distance from the main entrance around all the classrooms for all the pipe work to run, all the electrical cables? What type of floor finishes are we going? What furniture is going in? And that's where you get a really much more focused cost. Generally speaking, what we see across projects is that you have um, a new project request cost that's always higher because there's a level of risk, a level of uncertainty around that. You get to stage one, it generally comes down. You get to stage two, it generally comes down. You get to financial close, it generally comes down. But with the market in the position that it's in just now because of Brexit, because of Ukraine, because of energy, because of uh, inflation, um, those prices are, they have a risk of going up as well. And that's what we're seeing. So it's not because the scope has changed on the project, it's actually just a reflection of the market and, and, and how it stands at this position in, in time. So. We, we need permission, authority to, to move through the, the stage one process. Um, we will then have a much more focused 
cost analysis done for stage two before we move into a financial close. At any point through all of those decisions and those values coming forward, as a council, we can step away. We, we do not need to, we are, we're not in any contractual arrangements until um, we sign that uh, financial close agreement. So uh, the, the, the challenge just now is allowing the project to continue to move and not have any further delays and not hit any roadblocks or headaches. Um, so, so we will bring back um, a, a, a much more detailed report around the cost elements that we think we um, require to be able to deliver the project as it stands just now. We've, we've gone through quite an extensive um, appraisal of the detail within the, the, the specification and we've removed quite a few things to try and bring that value down. Things that, that aren't really of, of a detrimental impact to the learning and teaching element. So, for example, ground source heat pumps was something that we were looking at. Now, there's a cost premium to putting those in from a capital point of view. Um, we've removed that out and gone for air source. So the payback period is, is, is longer, but it still provides a heat source for the school, reduces the capital cost, brings it back down to being more affordable. We've looked at the level of car parking provision, and we've looked at other avenues to, to attract for additional funding in for the solar PVs and energy renewables and electric vehicles. So, so we're quite confident that the specification that we've got is correct. Um, sorry for labouring this point, but I think it's also worth adding that there are prime costs for the building, and we're about £200,000 out on a £45 million project. That's really good. That's really strong position to be in. Where we are seeing the additionality is all of the other abnormals. Um, so Dumfries and Galloway, for projects this size, attract a premium for a workforce coming down. Morgan Sindel, who are our Tier 1 contractor, are suggesting that's a 5% increase in costs because of where we live. Now, that's, that's unfortunate. That's been recognised by the Scottish Future Trust, and they will support with that from a, from a revenue point of view. But for now, we still need to be able to afford the capital on it. Um, the, site, the site is a lot bigger than the school um, that we, we're looking to replace. So, so the school just now has capacity for about 1,400 children. 1,400 children at that point of construction would have needed a whole lot more outside space, etc. So we are funded on a metric for the number of pupils that we're looking to have in the new school. So, we're, so, so that percentage increase, if you like, is reduced for us. So we are paying a premium for the extra space that we've got. And we need to hold on to that because that's a really valuable resource. And that's why we're, we're, we're really keen um, to bring back to members, bring back to yourselves, um, uh, uh, the additionality that we need to be able to deliver this project. Um, just now it's identified at the 6%, but we'll be much more clearer and accurate on that um, come the May committee paper, where we will be looking to, to bring that information back to members to take a decision to move forward or not, and then um, it would ultimately be for um, finance, procurement and transformation to take a, a, a decision on allocating the additional funding to the project or otherwise. But I think just now in terms of position, we're in a, a strong place for attracting the additional funding from the government, but it's the fact it comes down as a, a, over a 25-year period and we still need to be able to find the capital up front to be able to afford the project in the first place. So from a project's point of view, we're keen to move it forward as it stands. Um, ho ho sorry for, for, for labouring those elements, but I think it's important to, to share that information. Uh, any further on that very comprehensive report, George? Yeah, I'll give you too many questions at once. Uh, I'm looking for a bit more guidance on the, the Police Academy. I know that Leap 3 is uncertain, and, and I know from a time as Vice Chair that we were looking at the bridge uh, as, as, as a potential part solution. But it's very much in the air, dependent on the funding, even if we get the funding, how much money we've got to develop the bridge, if anything at all. So there are a lot of uncertainties there. And looking forward, I believe there's a leap four process not too far ahead of us, and we're doing this work on the land, our learning estate at the same time. Um, potentially, this next move at Dumfries Academy will have an impact on, 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 the, on the future. So it's, and I know we can't answer a lot of these questions because you don't know the funding, but we need a plan B and a plan C possibly, so we're kind of ahead of the game if, as, as much as we can. 
Um, sorry, yeah, I, I did um, dribble on too much and forgot about the academy, didn't I? I should mention that. I, I think you, you're absolutely right. We are, we are treading water just now until we have a leap three announcement or, or otherwise. What we do know is we have the £23.6 million secured through the capital investment strategy to allow us to invest in um, Munover and, and Dumfries Academy. Now, that, that won't touch the whole building. That, that will do an element of it. Um, and what that element looks like is really, really difficult at this stage um, to determine that. I, I think that's something that will absolutely move forward should we be unsuccessful with the Leap Free funding. Um, what, what we would look to do is bring back to members the, uh, an options appraisal of sorts to say, listen, this is what we can do with £23.6 million, but if you still want to commit to the full whole-scale refurbishment of the academy, this is the numbers that we're talking about associated with that. Or, if members are so minded, looking at alternatives to any of that, then that's something that could be proposed as well. Um, I think you're absolutely right. We, we, we have to be mindful that what we're trying to do is create a sustainable school estate, and everything that we're talking about just now has to fit within that sustainable school estate model. Thanks on that. And uh, I've got all the Ds now, Councillor Dorwards, followed by Councillor Dougie Campbell, followed by Councillor Dempster. Linda? Thank you, Chair. I'm glad to be the first D in that role. Um, thank you for the report, uh, Lara and John and Neil. It's a really comprehensive report. I'm not going to ask too many questions about future proofing, just based on the report itself. But first one I want to ask, if you'll indulge me a couple of questions, Chair. Um, one, I know you've made representations to the Scottish Government in terms of LEAP 3, and it's the Chief Exec that put that, that name that went on that bid. How robust have these representations? I'm sure they have been robust. But is there anything more we can do to flag up the issue with Scottish Government about the urgency? I know that there's a new first, well, a new leader of the SNP, potentially a new first minister um, in today. I don't understand why that's delaying it. <clears throat> I don't want you to give me a long explanation, but is there anything we can do as a council to push that on a bit? And I'll come back and ask my second question when you've answered the first one. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think... We've been sending quite a number of emails on a fairly regular basis saying, listen, can we get an odd an indication of, of, of what's taking place here? So far, it's just it's, it's been the standard email response. Um, we will tell you when we know. And, uh, Thanks for that. That's appalling um, in, in terms of, of where we are. I'm not, that's, that's my comment, not yours, Lauren. Um, in terms of local councils needing funding urgently from Scottish Government to complete projects. Um, but I appreciate that. My second question or, or more comment um, is, is basically about the funding that we've got for DLT, DLT2. So um, we've got 74 million, part of that is 26.3 million um, from the council, other parts from Scottish Government. In terms of that, you said 45 something, 45 million um, for Dumfries High School. So this is just to comment on this, is actually, this has all been since, what, 2020, 2019, something that's been fully committed and fully allocated by the Council. So is isn't something that we're arguing over. We're not arguing over the funding. The funding is there, although there are uplifts required. It is reassuring um, for LEAP 1 and LEAP 2 to have that additional funding of 11% potentially promised by Scottish Government. Is that correct? So there's, there's going to be some assistance there with inflation, which is good. Um, but I don't think no one's arguing, well, from my perspective, anyway, I'm not getting that back from anybody. Nobody's arguing about the requirement to do this, and especially Dumfries High School, which is almost ready to go in terms of where it is. So I, th I think the, ch the, 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 the challenging thing going forward is to find the 6% affordability cap, because that seems to be there at the moment. There might be more, who knows where, where we're going. But every single local authority in Scotland will be faced with the same issues every single local authority will be faced with the same funding gaps. And I think what we need to do is really robustly, as an education and learning committee, as an FPT committee, and as a full council, look at this as something that has been allocated, that has been planned for a number of years. And I know you say it can come off the table, it can come back on the table, it's flexible. I, I think, and certainly the Labour group think, this is absolutely something that should be going ahead because it was something in the council plan last year, it's something in this council plan as well. So <clears throat> I don't think we should be looking at taking it off the table, certainly not for Dumfries High School and certainly not for moving Lowerburn Primary School um, 
to the Academy. These are absolutely essential things that have been on the books for a long, long time. I'm not asking for you to, to say a yes or no to that. I'm just commenting to, to the... Um, and it'd be interesting to see what other elected members think, but I think it would be foolish and regressive to even think about taking these off the books. Thank you. Lauren. Thank you, Chair. I think um, w w one thing that I think is worth adding, you know, the, the, the £74 million is capital funding that's been allocated to DLT2, ir irrelevant of whether we're successful in Leap 1, 2 or 3. Um, that, that money has been allocated to the projects now, and that stays there, and, that, and that's confirmed. Um, what also provides a, a level of reassurance is that when um, the, the, the LEAP project board at a national level were looking across projects um, all over Scotland, our, our project is a, a, a fraction out compared to others. There are some other projects that start off with a base cost of £40 million and are £30 million out. So in terms of positioning and, and, and how we sit within the marketplace, we're in a really strong position compared to some other local authorities. So we've, 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 we've got that advantage um, in terms of being able to deliver this project. Yes, unfortunately, we're, we're talking about being 6% short of delivering the high school as it stands just now, um, with the reassurance that that additional funding um, and the reasons for the, the shortfall have been confirmed through the Scottish Future Trust. So, so that will come as a revenue um, allocation, hopefully, further down. The hard part is the, the Leap 3 funding and, and the uncertainty around whether we'll be successful on that. I think, for, for, for members' awareness, um, the, all of the Leap funding comes from one pot, whether it's Leap 1, 2 or 3. And obviously, Leap 1 and 2 projects have taken a fair chunk of that already. And any additionality will have to come from that same pot. So the level of spending that's available for Leap 3 is reducing. Um, so the successfulness of the Police Academy through that process will be impacted as well. Now, we have no insight into how many projects will be confirmed or otherwise. Um, so, so, so really just sharing that for awareness more than anything. But I think, for, for, from, my, my, from my perspective, you're absolutely right. The high school, for, for me, um, is, is in a secure place, albeit there's a little gap there. The academy is, is a much more interesting project, and we need to see how that develops. And a critical part will be um, announcement of Leap 3 or not, and then the decisions we take um, thereafter. Thanks. I, I share Councillor Dorward's concern that we haven't heard yet on the on our bid to the Scottish Government. Hopefully, a, a, a new broom will speed things forward. And if not, if we don't hear by the end of maybe April, I think we should, I certainly should write to them and ask them what's happening. But I'm sure you'll continue to press for it, press for an answer, Lauren. Thank you. Got Dougie. That, thanks, Chair. Uh, just on. That exact point that you're, you're making there, Richard. Um, so I've got a, a question for you and a, a proposal. Um, and you've half agreed for the proposal. But in terms of the question, uh, in, in relation to your, your COSLA role, um, has there been any uh, discussions as, uh, with other local authorities? Because I note that the LEAP 3 is obviously impacting on the other 31 local authorities. Um, just be interesting if, if you have got any information on that. And I, I think uh, it would be good for you, if you're minded to do so, to, to write now uh, to the Scottish Government, get in there quick. Um, there might be a new Cabinet Secretary, I, I don't know. But if um, Dumfries and Galloway's plea was in there early, um, I think that would be great. So is that something you could agree to do sooner rather than later? Yeah, what I can do is, as soon as we know who the Cabinet Secretary is, we can, I can write to them and, and congratulate them and say, could you move this forward? Is that a f fair way of doing it? Yeah, fair. I will get Councillor Dempster. Did you invite me in, Chair? Richard. OK, thank you. Uh, any other people want to speak? No. I have got my... Yes. All right. The, OK, Jim. Thanks, Chair. I know, just have a couple of concerns I just want to float with members. And I've always supported the development of the school's estate. Uh, it, it, we're, we're buying into our future, but... I'm really concerned about... Anyone who thinks there's not been a change since 2019, 
I think, but they might be somewhat deluded with, with, with the opportunity for home working. The fact that a lot of children that attended Dumfries Academy weren't they actually zoned to that school. John Thin, and I see John with us today, told us it'd be a 20% reduction approximately in the school numbers over the next 10 to 20 years. Are we confident that we are still looking to a school capacity that reflects the accuracy or the current situation rather than the assessment we made in 2019. And of course, the bridge is the other elephant in the room that I don't think anyone ever absolutely convinced of its true role and what we could be doing with it to better the whole school estate. Concerns without any proposals, Chairman, but it might be useful because Laran did talk about an options appraisal. It might also be an opportunity to review the current a, a role, potential role, and whether or not we could maybe scale back the, the size of the school that would bridge the, the funding gap that you raised earlier on, Laren. Just thoughts, Chairman, without any proposal at this uh, stage, but I'm really concerned that we're wandering along here without accurate, up-to-date information that might better inform members and, and give them a better a opportunity to judge the, the, the reality of the situation rather than what we imagine is the case. Thanks, Chair. Aaron. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I've got complete confidence in the numbers that we have in terms of school roles and the capacities that we need for them um, because they're reviewed on a, on a regular basis and, and they're not the bids and the capital requirement isn't based on numbers from 2019. It's based on numbers that we're seeing just now, because that and that and that continually um, evolves and changes. I think I think the point's well made, though, because it's a it's a difficult um, position that we find ourselves in. We know that the National Record Scotland are telling us that our our um, population is in decline and our pupil numbers, sorry, children numbers between zero and fifteen is due to drop by twenty percent by 2045. Now. That gives you a completely different school estate in 2045 than it does now. We cannot build our schools and make our schools appropriate for the size that they need to be in 2045. They need to be able to accommodate the children that we've got today and tomorrow and future days. But what we need is a school estate that's flexible enough and agile enough to evolve as those numbers move along. And I think what we'll find, hopefully, through the school's modelling process is a, a school estate management plan that takes us from today to 35 years' time, whatever, whatever length of time it, it, it takes to get to there. Because we, we can't go whole school change across the board in one go. We, we, we simply don't have the, the resource and the funding to be able to do that in one go. We need to manage this as a, as a, as a stepped process. Um, and, and, and gathering the, the right criteria to see and define what the school estate needs to look like and then marrying up our investment through the asset class and through our strategic projects allows us to move through all those elements. Um, so in, in terms of the numbers of pupils and the, the bids submitted for LEAP3 funding, I have every confidence that, that the detail within there is accurate. Um, not to say it will be different in 5, 10, 15 years' time. Absolutely it will. Um, but I'm confident that what we've got on the paper just now is, is the right size for the school estate and the number of pupils that we've got. Happy with that assurance, Jim? Absolutely, Chairman. No, no, that's absolutely fine. I, I wait and see what the option appraisal brings forward in the, in the future. I've got Councillor Young wanting to come in as well. Thank you, Chair. Uh, what an interesting discussion this is. Of course, an outsider might say, why not just increase the capacity of the brand new Dumfries High School to incorporate the students from Dumfries Academy? But I think that's a, that's a discussion that's been passed. Um, the, the, the question I want to ask is quite simple. Could you explain what the role of the bridge is at the moment? Is it a community asset or is it a school? Is it open to be used by the community of Dumfries at the moment, or is it simply um, an, a, a, already an uh, extension of Dumfries Academy? Thanks very much. 
Thank you, Councillor Young. Um, just now, it, it, it continues on um, its, its shared use and functionality. Whilst there are quite a, a number of schools using the facility um, on, a, on a booking process, there's still quite a, an extensive use through, through the community or other council services um, and, and third sector. Um, whilst we have proposed that the bridge becomes part of Dumfries Academy, we haven't moved to that model and we won't move to that model until um, we've, we've got clarity on the funding and clarity on the design and clarity um, through yourselves as members that that's the, the, the chosen um, method of delivering the Leap 3 uh, project. So just now it remains uh, as the status quo in terms of the facility, although it has moved away from being um, a, a, a trust in terms of organisation, it, it sits within the education portfolio now um, as, a, as an entity, but it, it, in terms of its function, it remains as was. Councillor Young, are you happy with that? Great. Thanks for that explanation, Martin. Councillor Law. Thank you. Um, I'm just asking this actually on behalf of a councillor who's not on this committee. Um, he has groups in his area who are trying to book the bridge um, out with school hours, community groups that have used it previously, and they've been told that they can't use it, and I think that's just a question that we need to raise about it being still a shared building or just education. I think if you're able to share the details around all this with, with me directly, I can make sure the officers responsible for, for the bridge um, can, can, can answer those. Sir Wilson, then Stevenson, then Jimson. Thanks, Chair. Just following on for Councillor Young's a question regarding the bridge, if, if you decide to go ahead with using the bridge as part of Dumfries Academy, would it be further consultation before doing so? Thank you. Um, I, I, absolutely. I, I, similarly to the, the high school project, before we go to financial close, we have to bring that back to yourselves as elected members to take the final decision on whether you're in agreement with um, A, the, the, the capital investment required against it and ultimately the project that sits behind that. But in terms of moving the academy project forward, once we have clarity on the Leap 3 funding, we'll, we'll re-engage and, and look at um, all the, the different nuances around how that relationship can work. Because I, I, understandably, I appreciate there are some concerns around that particular model. Um, and we, we have to take everyone with us on that journey and just make sure that we can, we may not get to 100% um, agreement and, and solution on everything, but what we do need to do is make sure that we've got a, a model that works and delivers a, a first-class education experience for all of our youngsters going through, whether that's solely in the academy or whether that's in, in collaboration with the bridge in, 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 in one shared campus. Um, but, yeah. Councillor Stevenson. Hey, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a few comments to make. I know quite a few of my... Uh, the public in my ward uh, send their children to either Lowburn or the Academy. Um, and part of that is actually due to work commitments. And again, as we talked about in another agenda item, this is parents voting with their feet. So I think we need to be taking this into account. We also have a policy on the council for town centre living, which will need to be taken into account, and also the um, housing ship a requirement as well and these are all reasons that we, we need to look into this a bit more further but it's not just as easy to say let's look at the catchment because there are many many reasons why people send their children elsewhere as we've already discussed uh, within this committee today um, like I say just a, just a point to make but I do think you know this is the most one of the most historic schools in our region um, I'm quite concerned that, despite the facts in the council plan, some members feel that you know we should actually be discussing whether we keep it open or not. Thank you. Comment that. Thank you very much for that one. And councillor, chairman, just to say that many years ago we agreed. Councillor Jimison first, uh, Jim, and then oh, you. Oh, sorry, I thought you invited me in. Not councillor Jim. Councillor Jimison. It's okay, Jim, I'm going, to, I'm going to use your name anyway. Uh, on the back of Jim's comment, Jim Dempter's comment, and, and also John Lowe's and, and the discussions that we've come back from LAN, I'm wondering um, whether in the recommendations we, we should add that there's a commitment to consider the options going forward, whether or not LEAP 3 is successful or not, but acknowledge that any decisions must take into account the future needs of the learning estate. My reason for that is we don't want to make short-term decisions that might affect long-term 
long-term outcomes. So I, I would be keen for that, that to acknowledge that once we have an understanding of the outcomes of LEAP 3, that we have an update on the options and that these options should consider the current and the future demands on the learning estate, which will be informed by the consultation that's, that's ongoing with the officials just now. I think that will be inherent in the... Is that, are you happy that that's, that that will be the way we proceed? Um, if I may, Chair, I, I, that would happen as part of the process anyway. Um, so, so when we are informed about LEAP3 funding, we would have to come back to the committee, and I'm hoping it would be the May committee, and say we've been successful or we haven't been successful. If we are successful, then the £23.6 million that we've got sitting isn't enough to deliver that project. So whatever happens, we have to come back and say, if we're looking um, at the LEAP3 project and delivering all of that, here is the capital requirement to meet that project's needs. And it will be much higher than the 23.6. And then therefore, we would have to recommend through this committee, if that's, if that's appropriate, to go forward um, to, to secure the additional capital to be able to make that level of investment within the academy and, 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 and lobby. Um, if we're unsuccessful, it's almost the same question. Um, how are we, what options are we looking at in terms of supporting those two school communities are we purely looking at and, and you know the options can be much wider than this or they can be much narrower are we purely looking at investing the, the 23.6 that we've got sitting just now are we looking to augment that in any way to to extend the level of the refurbishment and the extent of the project or are we looking at something completely different again and that's something that we would we would share with members and bring to members in the may committee as a, as a, a matter of course so i think it's crucial that we we get a positive outcome from this leap three bid. Do you want to come back in, George? Just quickly, I'm content with that. It's just the last bit that I'm interested in is, is the long term. You've said yourself in some of the documentation that we, we need to look not just one year ahead, five years ahead, but 10 years ahead. And I think it's an opportunity to reflect on some of the consultations that you've had to take that forward. I might be sounding impatient here, but. All the work that you've done over the last number of years identifies key problems for now and in the future. So any decisions you make now will impact on the future. And, and yeah, I, I take uh, Paula's point, there's, there's, uh, under Free Academy, I'm not suggesting we don't go ahead with the Free Academy. What I'm suggesting is that while we're at this critical juncture and the work that you've done, that we must consider short term, medium term, long term. And with all the uncertainties, but things are changing and they're changing very fast. And if we just mess about with we things, we decisions, short term decisions, we might pay in the long term because education, learning, society is changing. So it's an opportune time for us to, while considering these immediate concerns, we actually are very aware of what's coming ahead of us so as we, we can preempt any wrong decisions, we'll not get everything right, but if we can look ahead, then that, that would be appreciated. I think that's taken for granted, we'll do that, George. So, uh, we've got Councillor Dempster. Thanks, Chair. I wouldn't want to start an argument today, but uh, I've also been attending or attended a meeting where we talked about the future of the school estate, and John, again, and, and I blame John, but he was there. Uh, John suggested that if we had a blank canvas, we wouldn't necessarily build the schools where they are today. And a previous council, council made a decision to remove pupils from Dumfries Academy and make that a centre of excellence for art and uh, our museum service. We're also looking at a new home for a uh, the heritage or, or, or whatever, I can't even mind, but we're going to put it in the Europe. So just because that building's there doesn't mean to say it's always got to be there. And there'll be enough folk raised issues today to cause us to pause and have another look at actually what we're doing. And I'm sure that'll come through the work that uh, Laran's doing. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I think this, this is all for future discussions. So thank you very much, Councillor Dempster. I don't think of anybody else wishing to wishing to speak, so we'll go to the recommendations. Member asked to one, agree the minor changes to the project board membership detailed in section 3.1 and the appendix. Two, note the detail within section 3.2 to 3.26 around the Lorburn Primary School and the Fris Academy product, pro, 
project and three, note the information contained within section 3.3 to 3.3.7 around the Dovefries High School project. I'd be happy with those. Yeah, and we've got an action to correspond with the Scottish Government to to effect a, a quick outcome to our bid for, on LEAP 3. OK, thank you. Uh, we're on to the framework for inclusion, learning assistant allocation and staffing exercise timeline report by Director of Skills, Education and Learning. Hugh Smith's here to assist members on any questions. Uh, this is a report requested by members and for noting and also we're also going to note this, that the scrutiny review of the allocation process is going to be undertaken by audit risk and communities. His hand up first. Thank you, Chair. Again, I'm looking at this report and looking at 3.3 uh, at the January committee meeting set out the expectation that the learning assessment allocation staff and staffing was to be completed before the end of session and requested that a timeline be presented to March 2023, which we've got in appendix uh, before us. Uh, I'm looking at this and having just had a meeting only yesterday, which Jim uh, is aware of, uh, with, with a school in Stranraer, I did not get the sense uh, that the process has changed in any way uh, from that, that meeting yesterday in terms of that the, the schools would be allocated their budget and it was th from there that they would then have to determine how they allocate the, the, the support for, for, for children who need that additional support. And what I was looking for is that reassurance that it has changed. Uh, there are areas here that we've got the report before us, but some still to be confirmed, that the head teachers do know that there's a change in process that it's not budget, but it's assessed on the needs of the children who require that additional support in their schools, and then that, that, that we uh, provide for those. And I think it falls under getting it right for every child, that we have the, the adequate uh, resources uh, for the schools that need that for the children within their uh, cohort. So I, I just want that reassurance that it, indeed it has changed and that we're moving away from the system of last year where budget is given, then if the, 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 the head teachers need any more, they have to appeal to their peers, a, 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 a separate group. Yeah, I'm sure we change? discussed the options at the last committee and agreed those, and we agreed on an option, and I think we can give that assurance to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the option that was agreed was that we maintain the status quo in terms of the process for this year and that we would, we would look at that in terms of going forwards. What I would want to reassure Councillor Scobie is that the process is based on need. Um, we moderated um, for the last few years. Before that, we used information that was collated from, from uh, the matrix of need. That is the information that we use that uh, identifies the level of needs in the schools, which we then allocate against. That process hasn't changed, isn't changing at this stage, and unless, <coughs> excuse me, as part of the process of consultation that we're undertaking, we, we conclude with a different approach. But the option that was agreed at committee in December was to maintain the status quo. Yeah, Chair, I think we're still at the horse and cart, uh, chicken and egg, call it as you will. Uh, we, are, we are not providing for the children who need that additional support. What we're doing is allocating a budget and then leaving it to head teachers to try and work out. And that was clear from the meeting I held yesterday. Uh, and, and if we are on the status quo, then we will be, have children out there who are not getting that additional uh, support need that they require. And, and that's my fear in terms of the status quo, uh, where we should be providing for the children who indeed do need that additional need uh, and that the te head teachers are not grappling about with you know, a budget and it become a budget constraint. Uh, Hugh's already confirmed that we're meeting people's needs. So do you want to continue to view? Thank you, Chair. It was just, to, and I'm conscious of the outcome of that meeting, I think was positive, was, was fed back. Um, the head teacher is the teacher that knows the children best in the school. Um, we allocate an amount of, of staffing hours from learning assistants to the head teacher who then makes decisions of how best to use that allocation based on the needs of the individual children. I'm conscious uh, that from that meeting there was a, 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 
a, a discrepancy in terms of this idea that we are, we are now moving to allocate hours to individual children. That is a very rare circumstance, generally children with the most complex needs. And, and at this stage, what we do is we empower the head teacher, who knows the children best and the school best and the staff best, to use the allocation that, they've, that we've arrived at from, understand, from a, a survey of needs of the children to then deploy those staff across the school. I've got a few hands up by Councillor, St Councillor Stevenson and Councillor Jimerson. Thanks, Chair. And welcome this report because we asked for it in January. But I see in the timetable final allocations the 8th of May. Is this timetable going to be met? Because if it isn't, it we're going to be in the same scenario as last year. And I didn't see anything in the timetable about appeals date. Because last year a lot of schools didn't get their appeals to after they went back after summer. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, my oversight, we, we came back with the allocation process which we were asked for. There will be a process of review. That will be part of an ongoing sp uh, process. And we would endeavour, though I have to say that, you, as you can see from the timescales, it's very tight to be able to conclude that before the end of session. But in terms of being able to allocate the 12,000 hours across the 6,000 children with additional support needs, across the over 130 different um, provision places, including schools and our learning uh, centres, it's a complicated process. Um, and we, it, it takes time to do it correctly, and it takes time to make sure that we've captured the right information. Then we have a staffing exercise, which is over 500 learning assistants. This is, not, this is a really complicated piece of work, and we are co committing as much capacity as we can without taking our finger off the day job to make sure that we can deliver on the timescales that we've set out. I'm conscious that the, the, the timeline that's, that's, that's shared with members was uh, three, four weeks ago, and we will be updating that when we go live after this after committee in updating this onto the council website and that will be then be maintained and updated so there will be we would hope that there will not be much of a review process because we have been as engaged with our, our, our schools as possible in the process in the moderation exercise for them to fully understand and be reassured that the process of allocating the 12,000 hours is as fair as it, as possible and it is in response to evidence of need. Uh, Davy, a wee bit, I <laughs> That's uh, that's quite encouraging. <laughs> uh, Paula, uh, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, when I, I was looking at the timetable for the audit risk and scrutiny, um, I'm hoping somebody can maybe clarify this. Um, it looks like. The review will go to audit risk and scrutiny on February 24th, then to full council in March. And by this point, I'm hoping that the allocation process will be in place for that year, which means that by the time the report actually uh, comes to fruition and is, is implemented, it'll be 25, 26, which seems far too long away. Um, it, it, does, it doesn't feel good enough to me. Thank you. Thank you. You want to comment on that? Yes, my, my understanding is the, the Audit and Risk and, and Scrutiny Committee is to scrutinise the process and whether that was delivered best value. My, I am not anticipating that it will contribute towards the, the, the new process that we will be delivering for, for, next, for next, sorry, not next session, the 24-25 session. Um, I think it was part of the piece of the jigsaw, not the, um, the, the, the only um, piece of the plan. Yeah, thank you. So then, if just to just to get this right in my own head, so then if we have a new process in place because the education committee has agreed to a different process, eh, this one was only up until here, and then we would look back at it. Then, in actual fact, we could have a different piece of a, a different jigsaw puzzle sitting in front, trying to fit it into the what we've already agreed as a committee, because nothing would actually marry up. I, I don't really understand that process. Then it doesn't seem to tie in properly if what's coming from audit risk and scrutiny is just um, a review of the process and we then change the process it doesn't seem to match up thank you obviously the audit and scrutiny have, they were independent of us and they've decided that this is what they wish to do uh you come in? no thank you chair absolutely to reiterate your your position we were asked to present uh, to to pull a paper together for that committee um, and I think 
the po point of referencing it in this report is to offer some reassurance that there will be some independent scrutiny of the process. I'm conscious that everybody will have a view and everybody will want to communicate that view to, to, to members and to this committee, but felt that actually that the focus groups that are being recommended as part of that process for, for audit and scrutiny um, and risk committee would, would actually be a, a separate process that would offer reassurance to all stakeholders in the, the complex and challenging allocation of, of learning support. Did you want to come on that point, Willie, very quickly? It's really just the point that, that's been made by Hugh in terms of that there are 12,000 hours allocated to, to additional support needs with 6,000 children. That averages two hours per child. Uh, and it really worries me. Who determines this 12,000 hours? Uh, or, you know, and this is the chicken and egg or car, uh, horse and cart I refer to. It should be based on the needs of the children and then if there is insufficient for, for the directorate to come back and ask for more hours. But if we keep to budget constraint, then we, my fear is that we'll, uh, there will be children who will not get the proper uh, additional support that they require. So it, it, it's who does set this 12,000 hours uh, and, and is the process correct in getting to every child under uh, getting it right for every child and what their needs are. Okay, thanks, Willie. I think we've covered that. The, uh, obviously, we've got a, the audit and risk scrutiny review. will take these things into consideration. Obviously, it's, you can't do just the maths on that basis because support is shared between children. It's not just one one adult per child. It's more shared than that. George well, Jimson, my what's question to you was, who sets the twelve thousand hours? I haven't had an answer. I, I believe that members do. As, as that do the uh, bully and we, we'll have, uh, it's a budget matter, really. George Jimison wants to come in. Yeah, I was very fortunate last week, and I was able to attend a conference where the main speaker was Angela Morgan, who wrote the Morgan Review, and we're not meeting it. We're trying, and it's no disrespect to the people involved, but we're not meeting the challenges of getting right for every child or the Morgan Report. A quote, additional support for learning needs to be adequately funded to ensure everyone gets the support they need when they need it. That's a direct from the Morgan report. The risks that this council face, agreed by the Education Committee, increased experience of pupils' distressed behaviour, inability of schools to meet the demands and better understand autism and other neurodiverse conditions, increased number of learners on reduced timetables and non-attendance due to ASL-related issues, specialist and resource provision at full capacity. I don't... There's no disrespect to the, the people involved because I've got huge respect for the people in the Education Committee. But we're defending, I believe, the indefensible. We need to do better for our children. 30-odd percent of young people are identified with additional support needs. Angela Morgan says take away additional support needs for every child, regardless of whether that's 31% or the 70%. We're not doing enough to help every child because if we don't look after the children that are needing support, then it's impacted on the people that don't need support. Now, every child needs support at some time in their school, schooling, some more, some less. But we, I'm agreeing with Willie that we're looking at numbers, we're not looking at people, we're not looking at specialisms, we're not looking at the outcomes. And we're not, we're not alone, this is, affects everybody, but the Friesen Galloway has the opportunity to really grasp the nettle because we've got a, a resourced person that's looking in, seconded for a year to look at additional support for learning, or I'll call it support for learning. They're not just personal views, these are from professional people that are, that are telling me this. But to add to my personal anecdote is I've visited and spoken to a lot of teachers of all ages, of all experience, and I've asked them, well, at the end of the conversation I've said, if you had one wish, what is it? And they've all said more support for children. So hey, what I'm asking of is that we don't defend the indefensible. We'll look for, for more hours, more specialism, more experts, and we'll help teachers, parents, and children, and you for that matter. My last comment, and one of the crucial things that Angela Morgan said, is stop shifting learning assistance. Most schools in the region don't have that much change within the schools in terms of needs, so leave the learning assistance where they are. 
because they build up relationships with the staff, with the parents, with the children. And that's one of the things that really bugs learning assistants and teachers, they lose continuity. So that's, that's, that, that's one plea that we leave. Uh, uh, we shift them as a last resort, not as a first resort due to numbers. Yeah, I've, I think we all agree with that, but does Hugh, do you want to come back in? Th thank you, Chair, and it's, it's, not to, it's just, I suppose, to add to, to a few points is that I think Angela Morgan also does clearly reference in her report and more recently the role of teachers, and we know that the majority of those 6,000 pupils, uh, children and young people with additional support needs, will get their needs met by the quality of the learning and teaching and the quality of the teacher that's in front of them. And that's why we're looking at a big you know, program in terms of building capacity. We need to be thinking about different ways in terms of neurodivergence, in terms of trauma, about how we understand how children learn and we need to be able to better differentiate. I think I do worry that we, we conflate learn additional support for learning and complex needs in that it's an about an additional learning assistant. Just to remind, our learning assistants do an amazing and fabulous job. They're some of our lowest paid staff in education service. Um, they're generally not particularly well qualified. We are again looking at how we can improve their, their opportunities for, for on the job learning and training and development. But the, this is, as you say, um, uh, Councillor Jameson, this is a whole system approach. This is about our teachers, this is about our specialists who we do have in our schools, who do work to support those young people, who, who contribute to the planning and the, and the direct delivery. But I suppose to me is that I, I just worry that the, we, we, the constant of focus on our learning assistance when it's a whole system approach, which is what we've been pushing and have come back here to members on, num on numerous occasions, and that's why we preface the reports on additional support by framework for inclusion, because it is based on the principles of Morgan, which is that, it's, that it is no longer good enough to say that this is a small minority of children, this is a third of our children, and our whole system has to change to be able to accommodate their needs. Thank you. I, th I think we've probably strayed just, a, just a bit away response. from the... Just one from, response, please. One response. No, uh, Councillor... Just a wee minute, Richard. Just a clarification. I did not mention learning assistance, so I agree with you yeah, 100%. Okay. okay, thanks for clarifying that, George. We are staying a wee bit away from the subject. It's about the process of allocation. I'm sure Julie will be sticking to that process. Thank you very much. It was just a question for clarity about the moderation exercise, because I'm a full-time class committee teacher, I do have children in my class with additional support needs. I have submitted my attainment data, my levels of support for those children, but I have absolutely no idea what that moderation exercise is or what form it's taking. And to me, that's a bit wrong because I'm the person who's faced day in, day out with children with additional needs. Some of them complex, some of them not. Some I meet through the layout of my classroom, the way I approach things, where I sit them in my class, the children even. Sometimes that's enough to meet their need. But I do have children who need an extra adult in the room. I do have children who need that little bit more than I, on my own, can give them. So how do you do that moderation exercise? Who is involved? How do you decide? And I appreciate you, the job you have is extremely difficult because you are given a budget and you have to allocate staff within that budget. And to me, that's what the issue is. We know we have 30% of children with additional needs. We know that some of these needs can be met by class teachers, absolutely. You know, I'm partly through module three of my Open University Dyslexia training. We, we are doing all these things as teachers, but the bottom line is we still need bodies on the ground, but we need well-trained bodies on the ground to support us and to support those children. Because if I'm stressed and fretting, I'm not meeting the needs of my class. So it's as much about supporting teaching staff to understand processes as actually supporting children as well. So really what I would like to know is what is that moderation exercise? Who's involved in it? And how are decisions made? Thank you. Well, I'm hopefully the schools are involved in this moderation process. You can enlighten us, you. Thank you, Chair. I can, I can certainly reassure everyone that, that schools are absolutely involved in it. And I can only share my disappointment that our cascading of information through our usual routes has not reached the, the all classrooms. 
um, and I can go back and, and ask why that hasn't been. Um, we've had you know, significant engagement with of, um, school management teams around this and it's school management teams that are involved in the process. Process is looking at those returns and then it is sampling those returns and doing that as a group of staff from across head teachers agreed that we would do this via clusters. Uh, Julie, we'll, we'll get all this out to you and we'll, we'll make sure that it's, we'll put it in engaged. I think, we, you know, we tried to cascade it through head teachers and fire meetings so we can, we can do that, but we'll get that out into engage um, in terms of the moderation exercise. So it's generally being promoted um, teaching staff, both in school and within the, the, the director, the supporting learners team that have come together, looked at the returns, sampled the returns, and then kind of talk through in terms of trying to moderate to make sure that if you're talking about a child with a level of need as why, a similar child in another school would have a, sem a similar identified need. Twofold in that, A, that it reassures us all that the, the information that we're getting is, is, is robust and accurate and fair in terms of determining allocation, but also it is a development exercise for staff. We know that there are inconsistencies across our schools in terms of understanding levels and complexities of needs. And this the part of the moderation exercise that, that we are looking at in terms of developing a year long, uh, sorry, not a year long, a, a, a year, a continuing process of moderation is to move away from this event where we just simply look at to say what's happening now. This is about how we can build capacity so that if you're a child in Langham, you're a child in Stranraer, child in, in, in Sanka, um, or, or the, the Dumfries Borough, actually your needs will be understood, get understood against a similar framework. And that's using the, the stages of intervention, which again is a document that has been shared on a number of occasions with members at this committee. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Thank you. Sorry, I'm rapidly trying to scribble all that down here. Thank you. I just think it's, it's unfortunate that people on the ground don't know that that's the format it's taken. And that, I think, is a sign of how busy people are on the ground, that the information hasn't got to, your, hasn't got to teaching staff. I mean, I'm not alone in not knowing what the process is. So being able to put it and share it through Engage would be excellent. Thank you. So I, I hope the communications within the schools will be good enough for, for transparency for all teachers, but um, I'm sure we'll work on it a bit more than that. I've got Councillor Campbell, Dougie Campbell, is it, if you stick to the, 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 this process, please, Dougie. I shall, I shall try my very best. Uh, and again, just to say I'm a new member of this committee, so I'm trying to get my head around um, processes. And I've, I've listened with great interest to what you've had to say about uh, particularly the point about the, the quality of the, the, the education. But in terms of the process, when uh, the issue of 12,000 hours was, was raised and you said that the decision was made on setting those 12,000 hours were made by this committee, but I saw a few sort of puzzled faces when you, when you said that. And I'm really interested to know because the number of hours allocated um, will have an inc um, impact and bearing on the success of this this um, process. So where did that 12,000 number come from? Did education department ask for more than 12,000? I'm just really interested because it, to me it appears that uh, the success of this exercise could potentially not meet the needs of um, pupils in our, in our schools because there's simply not enough money. So it would be good if that could be clarified, please. Yeah, I think the, the minutes of the, the meeting will clarify the, the decision which everybody agreed to unanimously. But uh, Hugh, do you want to talk about the, the figures? Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry, I, I may have, if I misconstrued that it was members of this committee and the budget setting processes, I, I'm, I'm believing would be full council that would make decisions about how budgets are set. Um, and uh, I don't know what more to add to that. We have an allocation. I think it is a good and robust allocation. When I speak to colleagues across Scotland, um, pro rata, it, it's, a, it's a positive allocation, which has been very protected by members over a number of years. And I thank everybody for that. Um, in terms of the, um, the, where the needs change, I, I suppose, you know, I, I do worry about the concept that it's a fixed time, and that's why we're particularly important to empower head teachers to be able to use the, the hours that they've got. 
But we also do have, and we've run it for the last three, four years, but effectively it's always been there, that we have to have a contingency approach, which means that if needs change, circumstances change, children arrive into the area, children move out of the area that we need to then financially support in terms of their education, that, that, that we, have, we provide resources for that. And that's, a, a, that's an ongoing process that has met, um, as I say, for a number of years, but effectively was always in place, that we have a responsibility under ASL legislation to deliver a, um, support, and I believe that we do. Yeah, I think Dougie's answer is that it's bu we've got a budget to stick to, which we do too. We'd, li we'd like the council to get awarded a lot more hours, but uh, th that's, that's the budget we've got to work to. Yeah, I, I suppose I would like to know what 12,000 hours equates to uh, in terms of pounds and, and pence um, and whether or not the ask was for more hours and this committee decided on 12,000 hours. I'm maybe putting the, my new fellow members of this committee behind the eight ball in that one uh, and I doubt that's the case based on the, the, what I've heard in discussion this morning but um, I wonder if, if, if you if you could maybe, um, uh, you might not have that figure to hand at the moment but what, what is the cost of 12,000 hours? Approximately um, eight million pounds. Pardon? Approximately eight million pounds. Eight million pounds, Dougie. Yeah, and that's um, over 500 staff. Councillor Hill, want to come in? Um, just speaking on the process of what Julie was saying, um, have all staff been um, consulted, or is it just management staff? Were you saying, Hugh? Sorry, I missed that part when you were saying about the consultation process. Um, you've spoken to management across the Dumfries and Galloway across the states. Is it just the management or is it actually the teachers and possibly some of the learning support people that are on the ground that are dealing with these, you know, children? Because that's really important that you get an insight from them because a lot of the management don't deal with these children on a day-to-day -day basis. It is the staff and it is the learning supports. So possibly their views need to be taken on board if they haven't been, but I'm sure they have been. Am I right? Just to, to reassure you, Councillor Hill, absolutely, that we are, we're undergoing an ongoing consultation process. We've engaged with our learning assistants, we've engaged with our management staff, we've engaged with parents, and we are working, as I think I reported last time, and we've still not been able to implement that, uh, a, a survey in partnership with the EIS for all teaching staff as well. But in terms of the allocation exercise and, and the process, that we have directed that at our head teachers for this year on the basis that it was, uh, we had to deliver the model in the timescales that we're being asked to, and also that it was a status quo. So we've consult we're consulting on the wider issues in terms of does the whole model, not just in terms of the learning assistant allocation, work effectively? How can we improve that? And that will be, and we'll, I've committed to come back to members, I think, at the next committee or the committee after that, with reports in terms of the outcome of those, cons or the findings of those consultations. Chrissy. Thank you. Um, do you feel that the outcome, if it's one model, it will fit the whole of Dumfries and Galloway, where there's been yeah. such a, a large geographical area and having so many different types of individuals in different areas? You're, as, as, as local representatives, you're all going to throw things at me when I say, I suppose, that we would be looking at a consistent approach. You know, I think one of the challenges has been over many years is a question of, is the allocation a fair process? Do, is, it, is it sometimes those that have, apologies, this is the language that has been shared with me, where those that have shouted the loudest, and actually, are there some children that miss out? on support because actually there is nobody shouting for them. So it is about a consistent approach. It's about fair and equity, uh, fairness and equity. Um, but I suppose there is always, so, you know, our schools have different levels of need. They serve different communities. Um, so that we have to adapt in terms of, there is not a one size fits all. Um, and uh, that's the reality. What we hope to do with, um, and we will be coming back and reporting more to members at some point, and, and members may remember at the December committee, a focus about workforce planning and particularly around our learning assistants and being able to develop their skills around more specialisms um, so that actually we can, and, and I take uh, Councillor Jameson's point about wanting to maintain consistency. 
but also we know that as children move, you know, children, uh, deaf children, actually, that we need to make sure that staff can follow them to the schools that they go to as well. So, it, it, sorry, I suppose I'm really just saying it's complex, and that's why we try to maintain it as, as, as consistent as possible across the piece, while then we can individually adapt as we need to. Uh, will you last talk on the no, chair, I'm only come in when you come the timeline? To the no, I want to come in when you come to the recommendations. I would like to come in when you come to the recommendations, Chair, to put down a recommendation. Okay. Uh, the, uh, has anybody not spoken on this issue? I'll let them come in and we'll go to the vote. Have you spoken already, Paula? Yeah, briefly on one issue. Kim? Just Not this one in particular. Okay, okay. Um, so the statement there is that the hours that we're offering for children with additional support needs is compatible with um, other areas in Scotland, but I believe it's what happens with those hours, this average of two hours per pupil. Um, many pupils need individual support, but some can work in groups, and as it's been rightly said, it's the teachers who also can uh, is supporting that child. This is Dumfries and Galloway. We are not any other part of Scotland, so we can't assume inequality with those areas. We've got to do the best for our children in Dumfries and Galloway. And in fact, I think we need to be doing better than a national average and get to be known for being a really good authority. I think that's a statement, Kim, so thank you very much for that. We'll go to the recommendations, and we're going to ask, we're asked to note the timeline for the learning Assistant allocation exercise at paragraph 3.4 and to note the scrutiny review of the allocation process to be undertaken by the Audit, Risk and Scrutiny Committee as set out at paragraph 3.6. Chair, if I'd be allowed to come in uh, uh, between 2.1 and 2.2, recognising that Audit and Risk are, are already looking at review, but what I want to put is that we ask for a further report on the moderation exercise that deals with the capacity building which has been referred to by Hugh. Uh, so that we know that the, uh, that exercise is going to be adequate to meet the needs or the additional support needs of all our children. Uh, so we'd ask for that further report uh, to come as quickly as possible uh, in the recommendations. Do you want to comment on that, Hugh? Is, it, uh, is that going to complicate the process? Or? I, I suppose it's just the capacity that we have to be able to report on the process, which is time sensitive um, we're really you know we are committing as much as we can and without trying to, to drop the ball on the day job um, happy to absolutely bring back a paper to committee once the process is over which I think would not only highlight the learning from this moderation but would actually be setting out the the, the, the cyclical process of moderation so that this not an event it's a it's an ongoing process to build that capacity but I would ask for um, some time for us to be able to do that, not while we're trying to deliver on the moderation. Oh, sorry, on the allocation. I think, Willie, the, the priority is to get this process done properly, and then we can we will get an opportunity to get a report on it at a future date. And we're going to get lots of scrutiny by the Audit and Risk Committee, which which will hopefully which will hopefully be able to get involved in and uh, and making an improvement to go up. Chair, we've already heard from the teacher rep that they, they, they have not been involved in the whole process uh, or they don't know about it. Indeed, they were asking questions. Uh, Julie was asking questions on the moderation exercise uh, so that they could be familiar. If they don't know and, uh, and we're not familiar with it in terms of the moderation exercise, then I think we should be. It's under our name that this is going out. So I think we should have a report and that report come before us as quickly as possible. Uh, in that respect. Anything that I'm saying has not been a criticism of those who or anyone else who are involved in the process. It's saying that we need to make sure that we're getting it right for every child. And, and this is in uh, reference to the additional support needs that a, a child uh, may require. So I think we, we do need to, if there's a moderation exercise going on, we need to be familiar with it. And I'm asking for that report to come before us uh, uh, as quickly as possible so that we, it's under our name, this is going forward. I'm quite happy that a, pro a report will come in due process, but I think our priority for the moment is to get this process done properly so that the, that the 
that we the hours are allocated properly. So I think we will do that, will they? But it won't be at the next meeting. It will be a, a future meeting. Chair, I'm moving that we do get that to report uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, it's not within my gift to determine. Uh, I, I would hope that it's come forward as quickly as possible. And if that's at the next meeting, then so be it. But I'm moving that we do have that report on the modernisation exercise. OK, we'll go, have a second for that report. Okay. I'm happy to second that. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll move the recommendation. I'll, I'll move the recommendation that we that we have this pro, this this report in due and due and due process. Yeah, yeah. So you want to second that, Maureen? And Maureen also seconded it. So. To clear, clarify that uh, the next meeting is May the 25th and the process won't be co completed by then, so I would suggest it comes to the, the, the following meeting. Is that okay, Willie? Chair, I've asked for it as quickly as possible. I don't determine, it's not within my gift, what I'm saying is that, that you know, I'm asking for the report. Yeah. Uh, that was what my motion was asking, on the moderation uh, exercise, so that we'll make ourselves fully familiar with what's going on. I think of... I think we'll make the report as quickly as possible, which I think will be after the process is, is completed, which won't be till, till after the recess. Is that OK? My, my motion is clear. You're only adding in complicating issues, so you're advancing it as quickly as possible. Uh, and now you're uh, determining a timeline on it. OK, if you're not determining a timeline, I, I think we'll all accept that. We will get report as quickly as possible. Okay. Okay. If we're all happy with that, that we've agreed the recommendations and that we'll get a report as quickly as possible. So, item ten: developing a shared action plan with the Fries and Gallery Youth Council. Report by Director of Skills, Education and Learning. Uh, Jim Brown and Jonathan are here to assist members. We're, we're asked to be, uh, it's now open to the members to, to, for questions on this one. This is a. Councillor Jameson. Sorry. Uh, oh. <laughs> it's a query we were all, I think, well, most of us were, were at that joint meeting of the full council and, and the youth council and those three uh, relevant to the education and learning group. I, I believe these are recommendations, but have we made any progress on, on, on any of the three uh, items that were under the education and, and learning group? That is the free bus pass, the the SAMH, we have all mental, we all have mental health, and also accessibility barriers. These are the three issues that were passed at the, that full council. I'm just looking for a progress report. I know they all got complexities and complications, but I'm just wondering where we are with with all these three. Jim. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Jimson. I think progress report is that we're looking exactly as as you said at how we now implement those those three areas. They are. I mean, you can see with the detail of the report, they are quite complex in terms of how we go about doing those. I think they're very strong. We're, we're very pleased that we've, we've committed to those three areas of work. But yeah, there's quite a lot of uh, technical work before we then go about implementing that. But we're happy to speak further at a, a subsequent um, uh, committee. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jim. Councillor Dempster, was this issue, this issue you wanted to come in on? Uh, yes, just on page uh, 
it talks about your paper talks about the accessibility, which is great that some of the youth council raised, and I see in this financial year, Castle Douglas High and Sanker Academy were going to improve access to key areas. Now I'll take this up offline with Aaron, but I would have thought inclusion would have meant all areas, you know, just key areas. And I would want to understand maybe more what the differential is. The other thing I wanted to raise, of course, and it's not part of the education and learning, but there was a discussion about some aspects of education and resources. I've raised a concern about the appropriate department, and I hope we're not endorsing all of these proposals today, simply the ones that relate directly to education and learning. Thanks, Chair. Jim. Access to areas, key areas. It looks like Lauren's. Yeah, yeah, so I think I thought the, the point was that Councillor Dempster will catch up with uh, Laren uh, after the meeting. But Laren, if you're happy to take the question. Yeah. Um, thank you, Councillor Dempster. I, I think it's always interesting to see what the solution is for a particular circumstance, and I think that's the case at Castle Douglas and at Sanka. These adaptations are a response to particular circumstances for, for some individuals. Um, so, for example, at Castle Douglas, we're looking at um, a, a, a platform lift into the assembly hall for, for wheelchair users and from, from a mobility point of view. It's not a, a holistic um, a solution for the school. Um, the same at Sankar, we're looking at making sure that the ground floor areas are more accessible for, for particular individuals going into the school. So really what we're doing is responding to individual circumstance as and when those um, issues arise. From, a, from an inclusion point of view and from an accessibility point of view, the building stock that we have are all compliant at the time of construction, and I think that's important to, to emphasise that any new bills coming <laughs> forward are compliant with the legislation at that point in time as well. So our, our historic buildings are the ones that are not as accessible as they could be, um, so rather than go for a, a whole-scale adaptation across the board, which would not be reasonable or affordable, what we tend to do is be reactive to individual circumstance when they arise. How about that, Jim? Not really, Chairman. No, but I'm, I'm sure you, you, you'll not be surprised at that. We have children attending the learning centre at Sanka Primary. We are then shipped away to Wallace Hall because they can't follow their friends and peer group to a, a, the local school. I just think it's wrong, and that's why I want a, a wider discussion with Laran in respect of the whole school and not just elements of it, but I'll do that on like, offline. Sorry. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for your response, Laura. Thanks, Jim. Uh, we've got Paula. Hey, thanks, Chair. Um, we talk here at 3.3.1.1, that's a, a mouthful, um, about DG customer services centres uh, and schools helping to facilitate the process for the under-22 free bus travel card. But in actual fact, the customer service centre and library in my ward has been closed since before COVID and hasn't been opened. Now, I know some of the education department and communities are talking about this, but can we have a bit of a guarantee that it will be opening sometime soon, please? Sorry, I didn't quite pick that up, Councillor Stevenson. What was the request? So in here we, we talk about uh, DG customer service centres helping to support uh, young people um, apply for their under 22 free bus travel, but in my ward the customer centre is closed because it's within a school and the issues with COVID and access and all sorts. Um, do we have a guarantee that that's going to open so that these children can participate um, without having to travel into town? Thank you. I don't have a guarantee on that, Councillor, but I can certainly look into it and give you a, a response one-to-one uh, -one after. Thank you. I'll get your answer on that, Councillor Stevenson. Julie. Thank you. Um, it was just a quick question about the training for staff. Um, there's mention of the SAM, We All Have Mental Health, which I um, understand is a really good programme. And it says 60 it's a 3.3.2. 60% of school staff to undertake this. Um, 
how is that going to be implemented? Because obviously at the moment schools are looking at creating their working time agreements, which are, are contractual obligations for the year ahead. And within that, we have 35 hours of CPD, which we then do on top of our working week. Um, so it's just to make sure that this information is out to all schools in plenty of time, because if it isn't in our working time agreement, we've got no contractual obligation to complete that. So it's making sure that when there is training for staff, and I mean it's saying 60%, but later on it talks about secondary staff specifically. So is it all teachers? Is it just secondary staff? And can we make sure that that's out to schools and head teachers so that everybody knows about it, please? Th thank you for that, Julie. Yes, it's all teachers, not just primary, no, not just secondary, primary and secondary, and we will do as you've asked and get it out to all staff. Thank you. Councillor Hill. Yeah, my point was on that as well, because it does state secondary teachers, it doesn't state anything about primary. It also doesn't state anything about the learning support, which we've talked about having extra training. And if there's no financial cost to the training, which is stated on page 1283.323, then why are we not offering this across the board on teacher training days if it's only two hours training, which is stated on page 127? 3.322. Surely if it's free training, then we should be offering it to all staff, because all staff deal with these children. Jim. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that, uh, Councillor Hill. Um, I think what we're looking at here is the, the agreements were made on the uh, proposals put to us. But I take your point more broadly. I think that will actually form part of what we are looking at within the framework in terms of the building of capacity of the entire, what, what Hugh called the system workforce there. So I, I agree with your point, and we need to look at how we can make sure all staff have the access to this within their, within their contracted hours. Thank you. Yeah, you thanks for that. Even if it was on the training days that we have across the region, um, the kids are off, all the, t all the members of staff are in, and so possibly it could be incorporated into the training days, and then we know all staff are taking part in this training and also discussing how it could possibly work across their school, that I think that would be a really positive for a training day. Thanks. Uh, Chair. Yeah, th thank you for that again. I think what this, um, th this relates to is the different contractual arrangements we have. Um, we were they're told about the 35 hour week and I think we need to look at it more closely about how we can find the time for all staff to have to access this. But I take your point around the training days. What we need to do, though, is not overstep the mark in terms of head teachers' autonomy to identify the, the learning within those days. So I think that's, that's where we are now. But absolutely, as an aspiration, it would be that all staff have this training. Thank you for the comment. Thanks, Chrissy. Grants, Jim. Uh, Willie Scooby. Thanks, Chair. It's on the same point. And it's bullet point. Explain your responsibility in supporting children and young people with their, with their mental health. I hope it's recognised we, we, we cannot do this, or, or the Education Authority cannot do this on its own. And I hope that there is a focus, and, and maybe Jim can confirm, that there is a focus on uh, assessment of, of, of individuals who fall within the uh, autistic spectrum to try and get that reduced from two plus years of children waiting for a, a proper assessment on uh, the, their condition. So I hope that in terms of the support and the children, that from an educational uh, point of view and authority that we look for the NHS to improve on the, the, the lengthy time period that children are waiting for assessment. I, I will be raising it at the full council on Thursday, but it's so that we can get that assurance that every effort is made uh, to work with the, the NHS to uh, see how they can improve the, the, their time for assessment. I think it's children being able to be assessed. Jim. Thank you, Councillor Scoby. I think we've discussed it previously at the committee as well, haven't we? And um, I am working with my colleagues from the NHS through the Children's Services Partnership uh, on that, that particular point. But uh, thank you for raising it again. Okay. Uh, Finlay Anderson. Thank you, Chair. I have just a quick question. Um, so on page 126, uh, under action 3.3.1.4, um, it says that um, there will be promotion of the transport 
uh, Scott Pass collection app um, before uh, S5 Nest uh, six students go on exam leave. And obviously, we are getting quite close to that time. So is there like a set date that this will be done by? Uh, thank you. Jim? Thanks for that question, Finlay. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a, an answer for you on that. I don't know, but I can certainly um, uh, try and find out whether we've got uh, a specific date, but currently I don't have a date for you, I'm afraid, but I will get back to you uh, when I've looked into that. Thanks. Thanks, Finlay. Are you happy with that? We'll get back to you on that, that question. Yes, thank you, Chair. Councillor Jimson. Uh, just, uh, just a comment, Jim, you'll be aware of this, but uh, learning assistance contracts do always include training days, so it's maybe something that we can look into, depending on the contract, that uh, some of the training days that the learning assistants aren't paid to go in those days. So it's probably an anomaly that, that might be easily uh, sorted, but I take Councillor Hale's points that everybody should be included, but some of the contracts don't include training days, which seems to be a bit daft, but it's maybe something that, that you could look into when we're looking at the, the whole process of how we manage all staff. Thank you for that, Councillor Jimison. You're absolutely right. There are different arrangements in terms of the time that different uh, staff within our, our system have uh, to access training. Um, that's right also that the training days are there for all staff um, just in relation to my previous answer what I don't want to do uh, is to commit time that is for head teachers to identify within their own school improvement planning uh, timelines but certainly we we will be having those conversations within the wider conversation about as you described how we uh, create a, a strong and empowered system to meet the needs of all young people thank you for the comment uh, thanks Jim just on on Willie's point, like just digressing a little bit, we do want earlier diagnosis, but I keep referring to Angela Morgan, but it's pretty good stuff. What she says that diagnosis should not stall the help that that young person needs. We shouldn't be waiting for any diagnosis if it's very clear and obvious that that young person needs help. The diagnosis may help identify going forward, but it shouldn't, shouldn't get in the way of those people getting the support they need from uh, supported learning. Thank you, and again through you, Chair, but, uh, um, and as we heard from uh, Mrs Irving, um, uh, we meet needs as they present to us. You're absolutely right to say, well, if we have a diagnosis that can uh, support our understanding of how to meet needs, but we don't need a diagnosis in order to understand that a young person is presenting with a certain, uh, certain barrier, with a certain barrier, and then we need to um, respond appropriately. So absolutely take your point, and we are responding in exactly the way you said. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, last, last speaker is Chrissy Hill, and then we'll go to the recommendation. Sorry, can I just come in and get clarification? So, are you saying it's down to the head teachers to state whether people get this training, or that everybody's going to get it, but it's down to the head teachers to determine when? And also, can we have assurance that all members of staff who work in education are going to be offered this free? training please I can't give you the reassurance that everyone will be offered the free training um, in terms of my comments about head teachers it was specifically to say that on training days I will not be instructing head teachers what they what they must do that's very much down to the individual school however within the 35 hour week uh, there are there are hours that individual teachers can choose to use within for example their own uh, PRD process so at the moment, the very early days on this, I am very positive about this piece of work, but at the moment we're not in a position to say every member of staff will be trained. It is, as you say, is free training, but what we want to do is not overstep the mark right now um, and do this in a proper process. Yeah, I, th I think with that, well, that reassurance we'll go to the recommendations. Members are asked to note the proposed actions from the joint meeting of the full council and Dumfries and Galloway Youth Council on 3rd November included as appendix. Consider the proposed actions related to service areas delegated to Education and Learning Committee at section 3.2 and 3 subject to consideration of 2.2 above 
review the suggested way forward on each proposed action and approve next steps summarised uh, section 3.3. Everybody happy with that? Uh, I think it's a good news story because uh, our, our work and co cooperation with young people are really, is a really <coughs> bearing fruition. Thank you. We want to item 11, the Education and Learning Committee appointment to outside bodies. Uh, Jim's here to help, he says. But no, it's, it's, it's Nick is here to help in this one. And we've got, we've got uh, a list of people who are on the Depression Edu Educational Trust. And I think everybody on that list is on the committee. Does everybody wish to continue the roles on that? As, Okay, I'm not seeing any any dissensions. So, the Council Richard Brody, Chrissy Hill, Tracy Little, Kim Lowe, Paula Stevenson, and Caroline Wilson. So, we all agreed to continue. Okay. So, uh, we'll move to the recommendations. Member asked to note the appointments to the Dumfrieshire Education Trust and advise of any changes required. And no changes are required, as detailed at paragraph 4.1. 12. Any other. Business deemed urgent by the chair due to need for decision. I have none of those. Thank you all very much. We've had a good long discussion today, and I hope uh, that you all had a chance to say your piece and uh, obviously part of the